Your Excellencies, esteemed speakers, and distinguished guests, I'm Shade Betterinois, a news anchor at WABC in New York, and it Thank is an absolute pleasure yeah, to be kind. here today. And water. Thank you. We've got some eyewitnesses viewers. <laughs> well, welcome to the Summit of the Future, Action Days, a digital future for all. We are living in an extraordinary era of technological transformation. Consider this. A cook in Thailand shares a family recipe through a short video online. And within hours, people around the globe are replicating it in their kitchens. In mere moments, that recipe transcends borders. We find ourselves at a pivotal crossroads. Technology is reshaping our lives at a speed we just couldn't have imagined just a decade ago. It is revolutionizing industries, democratizing education, and connecting people across continents. In healthcare, artificial intelligence is diagnosing diseases with unprecedented accuracy and speed, delivering life-saving treatments to once inaccessible regions. Personalized medicine tailored to individual needs is no longer a far-off dream, but a reality on the horizon. Today, you will witness that transformation firsthand. A woman who is paralyzed will walk again through the use of technology. It truly is remarkable, and I think you all are going to be blown away. We'll also explore how technology is being harnessed beyond the battlefield. Satellite-based networks are restoring communication in war-torn areas like Ukraine, where infrastructure is devastated. Consider the plight of refugees escaping war zones like Ukraine. They often arrive with only the clothes on their backs, no money, no legal documents, and no answers for tomorrow. Technology, however, is changing that. Through blockchain technologies, refugees will be given digital wallets that offer instant access to financial aid and shelter. You're going to hear today how this groundbreaking solution is enabling refugees to rebuild their lives in just mere minutes. Meanwhile, there are so many companies using the power of AI to predict floods offering life-saving warnings up to a week in advance. And these forecasts are reaching dozens of countries, protecting millions of people in vulnerable areas. We're going to talk with some of these companies today. Digital access is truly a game changer for millions of people in isolated regions. Farmers, women, and schools in rural areas often overlooked for decades, are now part of a connected world, transforming their lives and economies simply by getting online. You'll hear today how this is helping the previously forgotten thrive. And as we explore these advancements, we must also be vigilant without proper safeguards. The same technologies that drive progress could deepen inequalities, threaten privacy, and marginalize the most vulnerable. Our digital future must be open, free, and secure for everyone, not just for the privileged few. So today, we will also discuss those crucial safeguards. There's so much to cover, and it's going to be an exciting day centered on harnessing the transformative power of technology. So let's get started. And first, I'd like to introduce Akeem Steiner, Administrator, UNDP. Amandeep Singh Gill, UN Secretary General's Envoy in Technology, and Doreen Bogdan Martin, Secretary General of ITU. Thank you, Shadi and. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this amazing room this morning. My name is Achim Steiner, and I'm the head of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. I'm delighted to extend a very warm welcome to all of you joining us for the joint opening of the A Digital Future for All event, proudly co-hosted by UNDP, the International Telecommunication Union, and the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. We are convening on the eve of the Summit of the Future when world leaders will come together in this building to commit to the bold new solutions that better reflect the realities of the 21st century and can respond to both today's and tomorrow's challenges and perhaps even more importantly, opportunities. Our event is part of the summit's action days, which focus on building multi-stakeholder partnerships and paving the way to a more inclusive and interconnected multilateralism. Yes. Today, representatives from every corner of the globe and all sectors of society will showcase digital solutions and announce new commitments 
to realize that brighter digital future for everyone, everywhere. Our vision of a digital future for all. At UNDP, we believe that digital technologies will be the fundamental driver of development this century, reshaping economies and societies and helping to radically reshape development, from driving down poverty and inequalities to advancing gender equality to powering decisive climate action. Working as part of the United Nations family, we are not only closing the digital connectivity divide, we are committed to helping to shape inclusive digital ecosystems in over 100 countries today to help digital innovation flourish everywhere. First, in our partner countries, we are supporting the development of digital policies and strategies that guide country-level digital transformation. Second, we enable the planning and development of digital foundations that underpin inclusive digital transformations, particularly digital public infrastructure, which represent the roads and railway tracks, so to speak, of our new digital era. Third, we provide digital capacity building support to ensure that governments and communities and citizens have the skills they need. Our work is only possible thanks to our partnership with governments, our UN partners, international organizations, the private sector, civil society, academia, and well beyond. That is also the spirit of today's event, to create strong collaborations that reach everyone, everywhere, and that ensure that people can shape their own digital future in this era. Thank you. Good morning. How are we today? Welcome. The future calls, and here we are. United, determined to build it together. A peaceful, prosperous, sustainable, and hopeful world where technology empowers us all and disempowers none. Our future is digital, and we have been hard at work over the past two years to ensure that it's open, safe, and secure and that it leaves no one behind. A future that upholds our hard-won victories on human rights and sustainable development. UN member states, with critical contributions of stakeholders from civil society, the tech community and academia, and the private sector have been negotiating a global digital compact. A uniquely diverse body of experts on artificial intelligence convened by the Secretary General has worked at warp speed to produce a blueprint for the international governance of AI. And it all comes together tomorrow at the Summit of the Future, a pact for the future with two powerful annexes, a global digital compact and a declaration on future generations, will be on the table for leaders to decide and adopt. The Global Digital Compact puts digitalization at the center of multilateral cooperation and a fit-for-purpose United Nations. It sets out principles and actions to advance an open, safe, and secure digital future for all. The GDC provides an ambitious agenda to harness digital technologies for development and benefit of all countries and communities. It provides us with a normative foundation, a moral compass, if you will, to benchmark our progress. It includes concrete commitments and actions almost two decades after the World Summit on Information Society to ensure that everyone everywhere is connected to the internet and to close digital divides. It recognizes the challenges of safety and security online and seeks to mobilize political and financial resources to protect against risks and harms. Ladies and gentlemen, the compact is practical. It sets out actions to close digital divides and leverage technologies to accelerate development, expand opportunities for inclusion in the digital economy so that all stakeholders have more opportunities to generate value and be more than mere consumers of digital technologies. It aims to protect and promote human rights online and make the digital space safe for all, especially children, women, and girls. 
It aims to advance responsible, equitable, and interoperable data governance. And importantly, it aims to govern AI for the public benefit and inclusively. At the core of the GDC is a commitment to inclusive, equitable governance of technology, in particular emerging technologies like AI. It makes digital governance a global public policy issue, one in which all stakeholders, private sector, the tech community, civil society, and academia have a role to play. We are at the start of a new journey. We need your engagement to ensure that the commitments in the GDC bring meaningful digital futures to all. Thank you. generation that has never known a world without digital. It's the SDG generation. Millions of young people who are stepping into their teenage years on the brink of adulthood. Their journey has been extraordinary. They've grown up in a decade that has seen part of the population using the internet nearly double social media surrounding us, and artificial intelligence going mainstream. They're too young to remember when the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change were adopted. They were just kids when a global pandemic turned their world upside down and shifted education online. Then, like all of us, they encountered generative AI. In a series of developments that have since been nothing short of extraordinary, digital runs through their veins. It's the most connected generation of all, and the first to come of age in an era of unimaginable digital opportunities. What will they do with all this power? How will they live up to this responsibility, and what kind of future will they build? Let's see this future through their eyes, and let's give them a seat at the table. So we're in 2030, a not so distant digital future, where everyone can access the internet anytime, anywhere. Where having the right device is a basic standard not a privilege, where digital skills are a fundamental part of education, where men and women have a fair shot at opportunity and success, where algorithms create equity, not bias, where access to computing resources are distributed more evenly, and where human rights are the bedrock of our digital society, where safety is the norm, and where digital and green transitions go hand in hand. In short, a sustainable, inclusive, and responsible digital future for all. Three fundamental truths that guide our digital track here during the action days of the Summit of the Future. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the digital future is not yet written. It's happening on our watch. We are all, all the SDG generation. So let's forge the digital future with the audacity of youth, a future full of hope, possibility, and ambition. The best future we can dream of. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you so much. Where algorithms create equity and not bias. So important. Thank you for those words. Well, now I give you SDG Digital.
Hi. It's not what you're thinking. We're not experiencing technological difficulties here. This is what our digital world looked like less than 50 years ago. This is what it still looks like for 2.6 billion people. Unconnected to cell phones, computers, global knowledge bases. That's not the inspiring, positive, optimistic message you might be sitting there hoping for. So what would a digital future for all be like? The world is at my fingertips. Just a click away, endless possibilities. What we do now will affect generations to come. No one has to choose between paying the bills and using the internet. The digital world must give every woman a voice and a chance to lead. Learning with the internet is like a superpower. Starting a business has never been faster. The time starts now. SDG Digital. It all began with a simple question. What's your vision of a digital future for all? We've just heard some powerful voices all part of our campaign leading up to this moment. Now it's time for Akeem and I to share our vision. For me, it really comes down to three words. Universal, meaningful connectivity. It's a driving force of the ITU as the UN Agency for Digital Technologies, and it's my number one priority. I want to be able to take my future grandchildren one day to the halls of the United Nations, and I want to be able to tell them the story of how we unlocked the power of digital and emerging technologies to everyone in this decade. No matter who they are, where they live, regardless of their gender, their age, their education, or the opportunities they've been given. We live in a world in which the familiar is giving way to the unknown. We cannot predict where our new digital future will take us. We can hope for it. What we can do is help create an inclusive, sustainable, and prosperous digital future. That means setting the conditions so that everyone everywhere can reap the benefits of our digital world, ensuring that everyone has the necessary skills, the capacities, and access so that no one is left behind. We must also harness digital technologies to protect and restore the environment and advance the decisive climate action we need so urgently to transform lives and livelihoods and drive progress across all, yes, all 17 sustainable development goals. At UNDP, this is more than a vision. We are using digital to change lives today and ensure that the generations to come have the ability to determine their own futures. This future that Akim and I have described is within reach. Fast forward to September 25th, 2030, the SDG deadline. It's our moment of truth. Formidable challenges that once seemed insurmountable have given away to a future filled with promises. Countries and companies have doubled down on cybersecurity, putting security first, They've saved countless lives and protected the global economy from escalating threats. We bridged the global digital gender gap with major breakthroughs in least developed countries 
where women's online participation has surged. Digital technologies have become a powerful ally in tackling climate change and in keeping the 1.5 degree target alive. Countries have worked together to clean up millions of pieces of debris in the low Earth orbit, making space sustainability a reality. Our efforts to develop standards against deep fakes have stopped the spread of disinformation and rebuilt the public's trust in technology. And today, developing countries are competing on equal footing in AI with the infrastructure and the talent to drive innovation that benefits us all. The year 2030, imagine a deadline that seemed so distant, yet our global community has achieved so much. A global community united by a clear blueprint for a better future. The Sustainable Development Goals. No one lives in extreme poverty any longer. We live in a world free from hunger. Nearly every child has a primary education. Everyone has access to clean water and sanitation. Renewable energy powers four-fifths of the world. And nearly every car sold worldwide is an electric vehicle, where digital technologies are powering decisive climate action and the protection and restoration of our natural world. Truly monumental achievements. How did we get there? Investments in digital were pivotal, ones that went beyond the next app or one-off digital solution. We need to invest in a digital ecosystem from which true innovation takes root and can flourish, where our global community actively shaped the AI revolution to improve lives. And now, as we stand at the threshold of a new era, we see a world where progress is not just a possibility. It is the reality we've built together. It is the age of possibility we are looking at. When Akim and I stood here for our first SDG Digital, we dared to think digital solutions could accelerate progress on 70% of the SDG targets. Now, in 2030, that vision has exceeded our expectations. Thanks to technologies like satellites, artificial intelligence, every school in the world is connected to the internet. When the GIGA initiative helped connect Brianna School in Honduras, her first thought was for the unconnected children. As she put it, all children have the same rights. That's true for countries, and that includes two-thirds of the small island developing states that lacked early warning systems. But the early warnings for all initiative changed that, uniting us through emerging technologies to ensure everyone is protected. These technologies marked a turning point in our efforts to rescue the SDGs and leave no one behind. I always remember Luis, a young ALS patient who joined us for our AI for Good Global Summit from his home in Lisbon. Luis had lost his ability to speak, but an AI device connected to his brain gave him back his voice. As Doreen has so eloquently articulated, we see a world transformed in ways we couldn't have fully imagined even a few years ago. We've arrived at a point where digital transformation is not just about technology, it's about lives, our lives, our children's lives. Consider digital public infrastructure. Every person now has a secure digital identity. Imagine, we're imagining the year 2030. This has unlocked services that were previously out of reach of so many. When the Digital ID initiative reached a young mother, it didn't just give her access to education and healthcare. For the first time, I feel seen, she said. Closing the digital skills gap has ushered in a new era of entrepreneurship that includes a young graduate of 23 years of age. Thanks to a new digital bank account, he has now set up his own green transport business and employs seven people. Or look to technologies being harnessed to deliver for the planet. Governments and civil society are now using AI to track deforestation in real time, showing where to take action, combating forest fires. I'll never forget 
a farmer that I met who used AI to help predict changing climate patterns and double her crop yield. Today, in 2030, we have a truly global AI ecosystem, and many of the world's most impactful AI innovations come from regions like Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia, to just mention a few examples. This is the moment when we said no to digital inequalities and yes to digital opportunities. When ITU and UNDP showed true partnership, as the world unites behind the vision laid out in the Pact for the Future, the Declaration on Future Generations, and the Global Digital Compact, it's a new beginning. It's the start of a journey towards greater unity, peace, and innovation, a future where digital technology serves as a force for good and for inclusion and for sustainable development, a future worth living for. This is a moment to redefine our digital destiny. We must turn skepticism into an appetite for the unknown, a catalyst for change, and a willingness to push new frontiers. The ITU and UNDP are working together to put this commitment into practice across the globe as part of the UN's promise. That includes driving progress on digital public infrastructure, capacity building and financing, the means to an end. And this is not just an idle digital dream. We are bringing this vision to life, like fiber optic cables lighting up with new streams of data, understanding and growth, powering a year of transformative breakthroughs for the SDGs. It all began with a simple question. What is your vision of a digital future for all? Today you will see how we can make this future a reality. To rescue the SDGs. To build right now at the Summit of the Future Action Days an affordable, universal, meaningful and inclusive, sustainable and peaceful, and prosperous digital, digital future, future for, for all. all. And thank you, Doreen, and thank you, Akeem and Amandeep. Well, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and now we give you, as we mentioned, SDD Digital. Thank you both for propelling us to the future and for sharing your vision. Now is a time to delve into the powerful words you mentioned, and this is Act Two, the hope of digital, and we're gonna showcase concrete examples of game-changing solutions for a digital future for all. And some of the solutions that we will see on stage today came through a rigorous process established by the advisory group of SDD Digital. So, let's dive right into it. Let's take a look at this video. Six billion people are unconnected. A digital future for all can only be possible if access to connectivity is universal and affordable. So to get us started, I have the pleasure to call to the stage Mohammed Shamil Aziz Jasub, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of Vodacon Group. And we also have Jessica Rosenworcel, Chairwoman, Federal Communications Commission, and Juan La Vista Perez, Corporate Vice President and Chief Data Scientist of Microsoft. Thank you, thank you all. So let me go with Broadband Commissioner Shamil. Shamil, I'm excited about what you guys have in store for us today, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Doreen, uh, and thank you, Akim, for the powerful vision for 2030. It's ambitious, it's exciting, but let's bring ourselves back to reality for a moment. Today, 
in low-income countries, just 35% of the population have access to 4G. And while Vodafone and others continue to invest heavily in expanding our networks, this problem is far too big to be fixed by traditional methods. The world needs new radical approaches. We need to boldly seize the opportunities in front of us. We must accelerate action and drive real global change. The convergence of the satellite and the mobile industries can help us with this opportunity. Now, something amazing happens when we're forced to act with urgency. When a crisis hits, we stop debating, we stop delaying, and we smash through barriers. I want to share two stories, real recent examples, that show just how bold we can be. First, when the Ukrainian town of Irpin was devastated by Russian attacks, Vodafone Ukraine used a satellite-based network to restore mobile communications fast. Second, after Hurricane Battle tore through the Caribbean in July, we turned to low-orbit satellites with our instant network on Union Island. Both examples show that in the middle of a crisis, urgent applica application of satellite and mobile technology can ensure that even in chaos, people's voices can still be heard. So here's the question. Can we harness this technology beyond war zones and natural disasters? Can we finally close the digital divide? Let's really think about that number. 2.6 billion people are still unconnected. 2.6 billion who are left out of today's digital economy. In areas of conflict and natural disasters, where terrestrial networks have been destroyed, low-orbit satellites have helped us provide an essential lifeline for millions of people. But in a digital world, still missing 2.6 billion people, we need to take the same urgent actions and find bold solutions, such as satellites, to solve the world's coverage gaps, connecting people, no matter who they are or where they live. Two point six billion people are excluded uh, from opportunities and disconnected from basic services. But I believe we can change that. Together with our partner AST Space Mobile, we are pushing the next technology frontier. We are working on a direct to mobile satellite network, one that doesn't need dishes or special equipment. We are aiming to plug coverage gaps in low and middle, middle income countries with this conversion of satellites and mobile in a safe, secure, and equitable way. Last week, five satellites were launched from Florida. They are currently 500 kilometers above us, preparing to test direct-to-mobile connectivity. This offers the real prospect of digital to millions of more people with just a regular 4G headset. With this technology, we can reach the last mile. The isolated communities, the farmers, the rural women, and the schools. Let me be clear, connectivity is empowerment. It's education. It's economic inclusion. It's health. But it's not happening fast enough. So how can we be bolder and really make the change we need to see? I leave you with three ideas. First, investment. To achieve universal access, we need $428 billion. That's significant, yes. But we need to think big create a scalable investment strategy, and make it happen. Second, there is no point in creating satellite coverage if people don't have a device to use it. We need to lower the cost of smartphones to under $20 in the least developed countries, removing duties and surcharges on low-cost 4G devices and promoting local production will help. Third, we need to ensure that we innovate in a way that truly benefits everyone and without doing harm, respecting the frameworks that keep us safe online. By the way, to succeed, we must think differently. Incremental change isn't good enough. We need something new, something bold. We can close the digital divide, but only if we are brave, innovative, and act today with true urgency. Thank you. Thank you, Shamil.
A lot of great points there. Jessica, now is your turn, so please tell us more about the importance of accessibility. The big idea that I want to talk about today is going to change and save lives. I say that confidently because it already has. So let me explain with a story. It starts on Hawaii. And if you've ever been there, you know that Hawaii is a beautiful place with a landscape that is often green and lush. But the climate's changing. And last year, dry, wind-fueled flames raced along the western edge of Maui, which is one of the eight major islands in Hawaii. It was the deadliest wildfire in the United States in over a century. The flames leveled the historic town of Lahaina, which is on Maui. And in the middle of this fire, when the flames were raging, we had five young people on the road on the outskirts of Lahaina. They were trapped in a white van. Skies were smoky. It was not clear where to go or what to do, so they decided to drive toward the ocean. But the roads to the water, they were blocked, and poor visibility quickly turned into no visibility. They were stuck in a sea of flames with nowhere to go. Terrestrial wireless services were knocked out, so there was no way to call the emergency number 911 for help. The van was hot and it was getting hotter. The situation felt hopeless. But you see, this crew of five young people, they survived. They're alive today thanks to a new technology. Their phone had a new feature, the ability to connect directly to emergency personnel by bypassing ground-based communications and instead using satellite signals delivered directly from space. At 6.14 p.m., their message asking for help reached first responders along with their location. And at 6.47 p.m., they sent a follow-up message to the dispatchers to say they had been rescued. Now put simply, satellite to cell phone communications is a game changer. By combining space-based networks and terrestrial wireless networks, both can accomplish more together than either can do on its own. They can make our networks more resilient and more available whenever disaster strikes. And we saw that clearly in the United States, in Hawaii. But you see, the combination of these services can do even more. They can end mobile dead zones. And that's why in the United States, the Federal Communications Commission has set up a framework, the first of its kind in the world, to support supplemental coverage from space. That means we're making it easier for wireless carriers to have all of our smartphones connected through satellites when there's no signal on the ground. Now, this is part of a broader effort at the Federal Communications Commission to seize the communications opportunities of the new space age. To adapt to this era when rocket launches are no longer rare, constellations are no longer small, and satellites are no longer just big, bulky objects destined for decades in our skies, we created a new space bureau. And our space bureau has streamlined our regulatory process for licensing satellite services. It has updated our requirements to mitigate orbital debris, so new space actors are always good stewards of our skies. And it's put forward a plan to support in-space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. Now in the end, the goal of all of this is to build what I call the single network future. And what exactly is the single network future? It's a future where we no longer limit ourselves to thinking about one communications technology at a time. It's a future where fiber networks, licensed terrestrial systems, next generation unlicensed wireless technology, and satellite broadband seamlessly interact in a way that is invisible to the user. It's a future where we have the power to end mobile dead zones. It's a future where it is possible to connect everyone everywhere. So let's make it happen. Let's build this future together.
Great, thank you, Jessica. Satellite to cell phone communication, no dead zones. Fantastic, incredible. Well, now comes something very special. Juan, you are next. Twenty years ago, a massive earthquake struck the Indian Ocean, causing devastating tsunamis that claimed the life of over 230,000 people in Southeast South Asia. The disaster was foreseeable hours before it struck the coastline, but tragically, there were no warnings, notification to people at risk. It was a turning point, one that underscored the urgent need for global early warning systems that can save lives in such crit critical moments. While early warning systems have, the, have their effectiveness to hinge as the crucial factor, communications with the people on the ground, no matter how sophisticated our technology is, if we cannot reach those in the harm way, the warnings are useless. There is an illusion of accessibility and current data in today's digital age. However, this is a misconception. The reality is that in many parts of the world, population data is outdated by, decade, by decades or more. The foundational knowledge of any warning, early warning systems is understanding where people are located. That's why Microsoft has partnered with Planet Labs, which image the Earth daily in high resolution, and the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington to create a first, the first high-resolution maps that show population shifts over time. To understand not only where people are, but also which of those people have connectivity to receive an early warning, we are collaborating with Doreen and her team at ITU in support of the Early Warnings for All initiative. As you can see here in Bonatou, we have harnessed the power of AI with planet satellite imagery and ITU data to identify communities that remain disconnected from communication channels. This information is essential for governments, companies, and international organizations to prioritize investment in infrastructure that ensures that everyone is reachable in time of crisis. Everyone in this room can be part of the solution. Through cross-sector innovation, we can ensure that early warnings can reach the most vulnerable. This is about more than just warnings. It's about giving every person, no matter where they live, the confidence of knowing that they are protected and supported in time of crisis. There are 2.6 billion people in the world that are not connected. In our smartphones today, we have more processing power than the one that was needed to put a person on the moon. There are very important problems out there that can and should be solved with data we no longer have excuses. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Juan, and thank you all to our speakers. And I invite you to go off stage and take your seat back in the audience. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like to welcome to the stage Her Excellency Emma Theophilus, Minister of Information and Communication Technology, Namibia. Ladies and gentlemen, our world is now implored with the situation of climate change. And digital technologies, digital infrastructure could be the answer to our challenges. With quantum technology, an opportunity where citizens, countries, continents can overcome their challenges through quantum computing and the ability to adapt where other continents are unable to. As the world races toward the fourth industrial revolution, Africa must not be left behind. Quantum technology offers Africa a path to leapfrog traditional developmental models. And if we're being honest, existing developmental models were not meant to develop Africa. 
and to ensure we accelerate the achievement of the Sustainable Developmental Goals. Quantum technology holds tremendous potential to accelerate our developmental and directly support the achievement of these SDGs. We need to focus on creating an environment where the basics of technology are met so that quantum technologies can be used to benefit all. We need to strike the balance between laying the groundwork while ensuring we don't miss out on opportunities to leapfrog. We need to recognize the adaptability as well as the agility of our local experiences navigating minimal resources for maximum impact in rural areas who can in fact contribute and advance quantum solutions. We need to do work to make quantum technology more inclusive and applications more compatible, and that involves African countries and global South partners. We're talking about an energy transition. In Namibia, we're talking about being the hub of the green hydrogen, ensuring energy efficiency and climate resilience, directly impacting SDG 7 and SDG 13. We're talking about enhancing healthcare outcomes, good health and well-being. Namibia continues to face healthcare challenges, including disease management and limited access to advanced medical technologies, not to mention the rest of the continent. Agriculture and water management, where climate change continues to see cycles of flash floods and droughts. All the continents, all the countries, these innovations will ensure an enhanced food production, supporting SDG 2 around zero hunger and SDG 6 around clean water and sanitation. Other SDGs can easily be connected with quantum. Example, education through increasing quantum literacy, impacting SDG 4. Economic growth and technological innovation, directly impacting SDG 8 and 9 and quantum cryptography to enhance the security of communications and data around governance, security, and global partnerships around SDG 16 and SDG 17. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Your Excellency. Next, we have Karan Bhatia, the Vice President of Government and Affairs and Public Policy at Google. Karan, thank you. Please take the mic. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. A clear vision for 2030, 17 sustainable development goals, the clock is ticking, and we're trailing. The time is now to get artificial intelligence into the game. Let's journey to northern India, where my father was born. It's a land often ravaged by floods, the most common natural disaster there for generations. Imagine flood, flood waters surging, engulfing homes, businesses, crippling infrastructure, endangering lives. It's a story that has played out sadly year after year with growing intensity in recent years as the effects of climate change are increasingly evident. But what if we could foresee the floods? What if we could warn people days in advance and get them out of harm's way, saving lives, saving livelihoods? For years, this was just a dream. Predicting when and how riverine flooding would occur was an impossibly complicated task, but it's impossible no more. Today, with Google's Flood Hub, an AI-powered flood forecasting tool, we're able to predict flood zones up to a week before they strike. It's live in 80 countries, reaching more than 460 million people around the world, and we're just getting started. We have been, we're going to continue to work closely with governments, with the United Nations, with NGOs to implement and distribute flood forecasts to empower them to act and warn people, saving lives and livelihoods. And AI is just beginning to deliver for the SDGs in this kind of way. It's helping farmers choose when to harvest their crops, doctors when to diagnose diseases earlier and how to, and educating people throughout the world in their native languages. It's a tool to accelerate progress towards the SDGs. But, as we've heard, with 2.6 billion people lacking basic internet, we've got to ensure that AI doesn't become a luxury. It needs to be universal, affordable, accessible to all. Digital inclusion requires action. We cannot allow the digital divide 
to now become the AI divide. Google is committed to bridging this gap. We've invested tens of billions of dollars annually in digital infrastructure globally, ranging from data centers to undersea cables, transforming internet accessibility. This year alone, we've announced new high capacity fiber optic links connecting Latin America to Africa, Africa to the Asia Pacific, Latin America to the Asia Pacific, and remote parts of the Pacific Ocean to America and the world. But infrastructure alone is not going to be enough. We are and are going to continue to invest heavily in digital skilling, training across the globe, building off our track record of already having trained more than 100 million people globally with Grow with Google. And we're now doubling down with a new focus on AI skilling to allow everyone access to this amazing technology. And we're marrying this with world-class com cloud computing and cybersecurity solutions that are critical to gain the benefit of AI. To close, at Google, we love to think big. And right now, with digital inclusion as our foundation, as our true north, AI as our superpower, and you all as our partners, we are about a future where no one is left behind, a future where the SDGs are not just aspirations, but they're going to be achievements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karan. Now I think this is a great time to travel to space. Let's take a look at this video, and it's going to be followed by speaker David Sapolsky from Amazon. Let's take a look. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Sethar. Go Kuiper. Three, two, one. Copy that, Proto One. We got contact with both satellites. Huge milestone. I want to thank the ITU Secretary General, Doreen Bogdan Martin, UNDP Administrator Akim Steiner, heads of state, and other distinguished guests. 2.6 billion. We've heard it before. We're going to hear it again, but we can't grow desensitized to this number. That's because behind the numbers are families, frontline workers, small businesses, students, and many others who, according to the ITU, don't have internet access at home. Progress is being made to close this gap, but we need more solutions and faster. So today, I'm delighted to present Project Kuiper, Amazon's satellite broadband initiative as a digital solution that can deliver affordable, high-performance connectivity to unserved and underserved communities around the world and advance progress toward the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. We started Project Kuiper to help bridge the digital divide for customers without access to reliable broadband. The goal of Project Kuiper is simple. With just one of these ultra-compact, affordable customer terminals and a view of the sky, Customers will be able to access high-speed broadband from virtually anywhere in the world. Our network will have the capacity, flexibility, and performance to serve a wide range of customers, including schools, hospitals, businesses, government agencies, and others, operating in places without reliable connectivity. The video you just saw included some footage from Kuiper's launch of our satellite prototypes last year, which had a 100% success rate across key mission objectives. Kuiper will initially rely on a constellation of more than 3,200 low Earth orbit satellites. That means they operate at a lower orbit than traditional satellites. LEOs, as they're called, provide sufficient speeds for many modern critical services, such as real-time video conferencing, telehealth, industri industrial applications, and live streaming. I'm also told you can shop online with it. Kuiper can also provide governments and communities with important tools for responding in moments of great need, such as humanitarian crises or hurricanes or wildfires, when other networks are incapacitated. While Kuiper remains acutely focused on advancing our shared mission to affordably connect the unconnected, 
Our principles of space safety, sustainability, and mitigating space debris continue to influence every aspect of our satellite work. Over the coming years, companies will have to work hand in hand with governments and civil society groups to shape the global framework for sustainable global space operations. And you have an Amazon, a reliable, constructive partner to do just that. As we've heard in today's program, the magnitude of the divide is greater than any single entity can overcome. Through Project Kuiper, we are working to contribute to the solution by connecting people who lack reliable access to the internet affordably. But we're not doing it alone. We're proud to partner with governments and industry around the world, such as Vodafone and Rio on stage with us today. Congratulations to the ITU and the UNDP for hosting this wonderful event, and thank you for inviting Amazon to play a small part. Great, thank you, David, and thank you all. Please return to your seats. And now I'd like to, to uh, talk about universal access to health and affordability of devices. Please welcome on stage Anne Ertz, head of Novartis Foundation, and Matt Granry, Director General of GSMA. And Anne? Thank you, Sally. Good morning, New York. A baby born in New York City today has a 12 years longer life expectancy than a baby born in another part of this city, maybe only a few blocks away. Why is that? Why do these children have to start with such a different prospect in life? Well, let's wind our clocks back. If we look back at the past 30 to 50 years, we've seen tremendous breakthroughs in scientific innovations that have extended our life expectancies by 15 to 20 years. And most of these gains were thanks to the progress in cardiovascular medicine. At the same time, these past 10 to 20 years, we see this convergence with technology innovations, technology that enabled us to radically reimagine the way we deliver health and care. We can bring health services to people wherever and whenever they need it, even in their living rooms. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? Still, Cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of death in the world, causing over 20 million people dying with heart disease every year. That is about 2,300 people per hour, equivalent to five jumbo jets falling out of the sky in an hour. And on top of that, cardiovascular disease is back on the rise, but not for everybody. In fact, it's disproportionately rising in people that already face hardships, in disadvantaged populations. So it seems we are not having the full picture here. We're missing a piece of the puzzle. That is because we don't really understand what drives our health. We know that only 20% of our health is driven by the care we access. The other 80% is driven by the conditions in which we are born, we grow up, we live and we age. Those social, economic, environmental conditions are not well understood. Yet, that is, because today we have an unprecedented opportunity to use the massive amounts of data we have in our hands, the computational power and data science capabilities around, to better understand that. We can bring data from health system together with the data on all these underlying determinants, be it um, education, income, employment, housing, security, or uh, access to healthy food, access to digital tools, you name it. All these data together can be brought into the machine and uh, advanced analytics can help us understand what truly is the leading determinants that drive our health and health inequities. Because only if we understand those can we address them and can we address them at the root instead of patching symptoms. That is what we set out to do with AI for Healthy Cities, a Novartis Foundation partnership with the cities of New York, Singapore, Helsinki and Basel, where we are deciphering the true drivers of health and health inequities. Only when we understand and address those can we offer two babies born on the same day in the same city or elsewhere a similar chance on a long and healthy life. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Ann. Now we're gonna shift the conversation uh, towards affordability. That's Smartphones are a central part of our lives. Absolutely. But there's a great barrier to entry, right? Yep. If you don't have the money, how can you get the smartphone? Exactly. How can you get accessibility? Exactly. So that's, you... that's what I'm going to talk about. Wonderful. Super. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be here, and I have a very serious message. Uh, my name is Mats Grandert, and I'm the uh, Director General of GSMA. I think I will have another slide here. So... I'd like to introduce to you this family. It's Fortiné and Paddy. Paddy being the father and Fortiné the daughter. The, she's a doctor. And uh, they live in rural Uganda. Um, the, she is the only doctor in miles around, so she, her services were so sought after. Uh, the problem was that you know, when light uh, went out, when there's no sun anymore, she could not perform her duties. Her father, though, realize that there is something called mobile internet. There is something on this handset that people are talking about. So she got, he got a phone for her, um, and she can now continue to do her work uh, and ask other doctors for help, but she can also deploy mobile-enabled solar power, which means that she has light almost as much as you want, uh, and she can then perform her service day and night, which is a fantastic achievement. Now, she's only one family. We know that there is more than, and we have heard this many times today, that it's 2.6 billion people that are not as fortunate. They are not connected to internet, and predominantly to mobile internet. Now, why is that? I mean, we know that people, these 2.6 billion people, the vast majority, 95 plus percent, live beneath a mobile broadband coverage. So we don't need more stuff. We don't need more base stations. We don't need anything in the sky either. It is just there to use. But they can't use it. Why? Well, it is all around affordability. And we have done a lot of research uh, on, on this topic. And the biggest barrier is handset affordability. It is the cost of this device, this little device. So we need to bring down the cost of the device. We know roughly $20 is the sweet spot, and we're not close to that. $20 might help some, but we still have issues. So the next step we need to do is, is to increase access to financing, to make sure that you can actually use the handset as a collateral and borrow money to buy your first handset, sort of like you buy a car or, or similar thing. And thirdly, is to re reduce or even remove the, uh, uh, the sector-specific tax. The handset is not a luxury item. The handset is something that is a true necessity. So those are three things that we should do. And, and from GSMA, we have a handset affordability coalition that has been up and running now for a year. And we're very happy to have Doreen uh, and ITU on board, as well as the WEF Edison Alliance, uh, and also the World Bank helping us to reduce the handset cost and helping us to make sure that we can get good financing. So let's get this done. Thank you very much. Great, thank you both. Please have a seat. Thank you. And unfortunately, we're running a little long, which means we have to shorten speeches. So this is gonna be almost like the Oscars. You know, when the orchestra starts playing, it says your time is running up. Speakers, you're gonna hear a little ring. Where's the person with the little bell? There you go. We're gonna hear that, and you actually have 20 seconds to wrap. So please bear with us so we can move this program along. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now comes a very exciting moment. Two years ago, ITU launched Partner to Connect, P2C, a digital coalition to advance universal and meaningful connectivity. To date, PTC's online platform has received over 900 pledges worth an estimated value of $51 billion for connectivity projects globally. And today, five new pledges will be announced to the world, and to announce the first one, Please welcome Alexandre Hayes Sikeya Freire, Commissioner of National Telecommunications Agency, Anatel, Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. I want to share with you one of our most impactful initiatives, a project that holds the power to change the lives of an entire generation of children across Brazil. From the resources obtained by the Brazilian 5G radio frequency auction, I may have to announce an amount of 549 million US dollars commitment to partner to connect digital coalition to connect public schools, particularly in underserved and remote regions like indigenous and African Brazilian traditional communities and urban outskirts in order to expand the access to information and communication technologies for academic purpose. Under the coordination of Commissioner of the National Telecommunication Agency, Vicente Aquino, we launched a three years pilot project impacting 177 public schools and over 13,000 students. These schools received high speed internet connections, Wi Fi networks, computers for students and teachers, and solar energy system if the premises lacked electricity. The results have been transformative and strengthens our drive to continue to expand the project, which means to benefit about 40,000 schools in years to come. The Schools Connectivity Project, led by Anatel, is part of the program Accelerate Growth, launched by the federal government in 2023. It established that all 138,000 public schools we will have connectivity by the end of 2006. So we must secure long-term partnership to maintain the infrastructure and the connection service after the 5G auction resource are over. We have a responsibility to make sure this progress is not temporary. If the power of the connectivity, we countries from the global south can face our specific challenges arise from inequalities building more equal and promising future for all. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alexandre, for that generous pledge and for setting an example of the importance of investing in technology and education. So thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude this session, let me introduce a strong believer in P2C, Rabab Fatima, Under Secretary General and High Representative. Rabab, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Again, apologies. As you can see, I'm not very digitally strong. I'm reading from paper notes because I represent a group of countries who are still not yet there. No? You can hear me now? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, very digitally challenged here for me. Yes, thank you. I'm using paper notes, not yet there, and using teleprompters. Doreen uh, Akim. Excellencies, uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share a few words. Uh, but first of all, let me thank and congratulate ITU and UNDP for organizing another successful digital day. Another fascinating, inspiring event, and I would like to thank you for keeping the digital agenda high on our agenda. As we have heard, the internet has fundamentally transformed education, healthcare, commerce, and global connectivity benefiting billions worldwide. Yet, a large portion of the global population remains 
disconnected. Yes, I'm talking about the least developed countries where only 36% of the population are online. The landlocked developing countries, the LLDCs, fare slightly better at 39%, while in small island developing states, SIDS, 67% are using the internet, and women and, and the rural communities in these countries are certainly the ones who are being left furthest behind. In contrast, advanced economies enjoy near universal internet access, exposing the stark inequality in opportunities, access to information and pathways to a brighter future. Excellencies, my office supports these countries, these 92 most vulnerable countries, the 45 LDCs, the 32 LLDCs, and the 39 states, home to 1.4 billion people. Nearly 60% of this population is under the age of 25, representing a generation with immense potential for digital growth. However, the persistent digital divide continue to, continues to limit this potential. This gap is not just a technological issue, but a profound development challenge. Affordability remains a key barrier to digital connectivity. The United Nations Broadband Commission has set a target for 2025 that broadband services should cost less than 2% of monthly GNI per capita in low and middle income countries. Yet, as of 2023, only four LDCs have met this goal. On average, 75% of LDCs face mobile broadband costs exceeding 5% of GNI per capita. LLDCs and SIDS face similar high cost, averaging above the 2% target. Even when connectivity is available, challenges persist as many are unable to utilize the internet's full potentials. LDCs, in LDCs, LLDCs, and SID, a consumption gap exists, but data usage remains low despite internet access. This gap underscores not only connectivity issues, but also lack of adequate digital skills and infrastructure. To bridge this digital divide, a comprehensive approach is required, one that integrates quality education, robust infrastructure, and affordability, and I would like to commend the partner to Connect for making efforts to bridge this gap. Yes, I'm speaking for 92 countries. Give me another minute. <laughs> Looking ahead, <laughs> Looking ahead, we must focus on more of such actionable solutions. Distinguished colleagues, I invite you to join us at the third United Nations Conference on the Landlocked Developing Countries to be held in Havarone, Botswana in December to continue this conversation. The conference will feature a dedicated connectivity track that my office will be organizing with ITU, and that will be focusing on practical digital initiatives aimed at enhancing meaningful collectivity for the LLDCs. As we look to the future, let us harness the power of digital connectivity to build a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable future. And I look forward to continuing these important discussions with all of you at the conference in Botswana to make sure that no one is left behind in this digital leap forward and no one is left disconnected. I thank you. Thank you very much. That's right, take your minute. <laughs> now let's move to session two. An inclusive and meaningful digital future is one where no one is left behind. Wondercraft, a robotics company developing a first-of-its-kind self-balancing personal exoskeleton, is enabling people who cannot walk the opportunity to stand up and walk again in their everyday lives. And you actually may have already seen this during the Paris Olympics in 2024 with para-athlete Kevin Piet, who became the first person with paraplegia to work, to walk the torch in the Summer Olympics relay. And today, you're gonna to see this very same prototype presented by Bianca Faith Johnson, JD. She is making her way there. You know what, we're gonna forget all the run-throughs because I just wanna get right through you. Uh, tell me, this is really a game changer. Talk to me about what happened to you. I know that you became paralyzed. Yes. Tell me about that journey. Yes, uh, so 
Seven years ago, I was in a near-fatal motorcycle accident, so no fault of my own. And as a result of that, I sustained a T4, T6 spinal cord injury. So um, that's the equivalent of me being paralyzed from about mid-chest down. And that completely changed your life. Absolutely. Can you tell me just how difficult that moment was in the journey after that? That moment was extremely difficult. Imagine waking up in the hospital and being probed by doctors asking, can you move your legs and not being able to. My entire world was literally shifted upside down. Um, but I knew that even in that moment, I was still going to make it. And I needed to make sure that I prepared myself for what was to come, for technology such as this. Well, I can see your sunshine just radiating, and I can tell that you are a fighter and you are strong. So, so shall we walk through this together? Absolutely. Okay. So tell me about this technology. All of a sudden you found out about it, but how did you find out about it? So I'm actually the acting chair of an organization called Push to Walk, which is located in New Jersey. It's a spinal cord injury gym. And we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity for Wondercraft, an amazing organization who is the creators of this exoskeleton, to come and do some demos. And I was a part of that demonstration. And from there, the synergy was just perfect. And I've been working with them ever since. OK, so let's, let's show everyone, shall we? Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Shall we walk forward a little bit? Absolutely. Okay. Wow. Wow. Incredible. So this has changed everything because one thing I remember reading about you, you were saying, like, I was standing up talking to you, and you were saying that before I had to look up, but now you're able to look Eye to eye. eye to eye. That means everything, right? Everything. Talk to me about that. This is how our bodies were intended to be. So, and then, of course, I was injured. So I remember what it felt like standing upright, walking upright, and looking someone and having that type of connection eye to eye. So now in this self-balancing prototype, this exoskeleton, I'm able to do so hands-free, mm -hmm. and I can talk to you just like everyone else would. And also just having the freedom to go where you want to go. I mean, did you ever imagine you would be here at the UN walking and talking to this incredible crowd? I did not imagine this exactly, but I knew it would be something like this. You knew it would be something. <laughs> Shall we walk a little bit more forward? Let's do it. Okay, so as we do this, can you tell me about that first moment when you got in the exoskeleton and then being able to move like this? It was literally everything because yeah. imagine for seven years I've been in a seated position, um, unable to stand on my own or walk on my own. So the moment I was engulfed and put on this exoskeleton, it put me on. <laughs> and I was able to embody the position that my body was used to doing. It is almost like a little muscle memory thing going on, mm. you know? It remembers where I came from and it's bringing me into where I need to be. And it's bringing your spirit to life again. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Was there anything else you wanted to share with everyone? This technology is just absolutely amazing. Um, and I just want everyone to acknowledge that what you are looking at is literally the future in the present. Um, it has given back my, it has the potential to give me back my movement and with it my freedom. Um, so I plan on just making sure that I'm maximizing on this opportunity. This should be a, a, a supported. You should be spreading the word, sending it to your friends, <laughs> and letting everyone know that Wondercraft in particular, it's an organization that is for the people, for people like me, so that we can get our lives back. And it may not change the world, but it certainly has the potential to change mine. That's what technology is all about. That's what today is all about, giving access to people, changing their lives, yes. right? Yes, yes. Is somebody here from Wondercraft? I, I wish they were. I'm surrounded okay. by them. OK, yeah. well, <laughs> Wondercraft is here. Uh, yes? One right here. Oh, right, right here. here. Oh, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I thought you were just helping along. Yes, yes. So, yes. so tell me just about what this means for you working on this. It is so inspiring. I'm a physical therapist by background, so being able to work with a company that puts patients first and allows people the ability to walk again is so meaningful. And 
that's why Watercraft does what it does. And I'm sure you've seen so many patients and you're seeing that transformation. What is it like for you on the other side, giving people the ability to have freedom again? It's incredible. It's stories like Bianca and Tony and all of the other patients in our lives that really, um, that we make an impact on a daily basis. So it's just very meaningful and we love what we do at Watercraft. And your colleague over here, I can't leave him out. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, yeah, I'm one of the, the engineers. Um, You're one of the engineers. Okay. I don't do. Um, so come, come forward, please. <laughs> Everybody can see you. I don't typically do a, a lot of PR, but, but um, that's okay. But that's yeah, okay. It's, it's great to be, uh, be on another side of the company and um, and be able to participate in in this and and working with uh, not directly as a PT like Sarah, but with patients like Bianca is really a gem. Well, this is, the, this is the connectivity right here. The engineer, what you're putting to paper, what you're actually building, there you go, she could even lean in, is changing people's lives. It's changing her life. What does that mean to you personally? Oh. Yeah. That's... We can I think... feel that. We can feel that. Yeah. <laughs> It's something that maybe I'll never have to experience firsthand, but we get to experience it through, like I said, a patient, great patients we get to work with, like Bianca, and be able to really talk to them face to face and see how their lives have changed. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your honesty, we appreciate your heart, because that's what really all of this is about. You know, we have uh, your excellencies here. We have engineers like yourself, PT. We have, we have somebody here who, uh, who suffered from this through the hands of somebody else. But like all of these things, all of these companies, and Google, and all these other companies, Amazon, and so many others, like these things matter. And this is what we're talking about, the digital future. What does it mean? Not leaving people behind, not leaving people behind like you. So thank you for everything that you're doing, and we really appreciate it, and making the difference here, and for so many others. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Shall we, shall we walk together? OK, which way do you want to go? We're going to turn? OK, we're going to turn together. <laughs> It's truly incredible. Wow. And as an engineer, technology is only going to get better, right? Yeah, of course. So um, like Bianca mentioned, this is a prototype device. And we're actively working on it every day, um, ensuring that we can incorporate more features to be able to give her more of her life back as she can continue to do more and more with it. So, so things are going to become more streamlined. It's going to just become easier, right? Certainly. OK, wonderful. Well, thank you all again. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> wonderful. Well, as they make their way, uh, pretty incredible, isn't it? really is. Now we welcome on stage uh, United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, Kelly T. Clements, who will talk to us about using blockchain for inclusive financial services anywhere, anytime, and on any device. Please welcome Kelly T. Clements, United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. <laughs> Thank you. Thank it's you, great, amazing, right? yeah, incredible. It, it, it's wonderful. So you're gonna be able to talk about blockchain technology helping yes. refugees. Yes. And I, you know, not only is blockchain just changing how we do business, but it's also helping victims of war-torn areas like in Ukraine or exactly. so many other places. Exactly. So you're gonna tell us more? I will, I will. In fact, I'm gonna tell you the story about Hannah. Hannah, yes. I'm looking forward so to it. So Hannah is a mother of two who had to flee from her hometown in Ukraine as the full-scale war broke out, caring for her elderly mother and her grandmother. When she arrived at a safe location, she had nowhere to sleep. After registering and engaging with our team on the ground, within 15 minutes, she tells us, the family received cash aid from UNHCR through a digital wallet on her phone. This support is part of a rental market program that we run in Ukraine to help families forced to flee find safe and dignified accommodation. Using cash to support displaced families settle into their new lives isn't new. 
Cash, when conditions allow, provide a more dignified form of aid, giving people the choice to prioritize what they need. What was new for Hannah was the financial technology used to make and receive the transaction. A digital wallet powered by blockchain technology. Technology is reshaping every aspect of our lives, and the humanitarian sector is no exception. UNHCR alone manages a volume of over 2 million payment transactions every year, handling transfers of $6 billion to partner organizations, vendors, and people like Hannah as part of our cash-based intervention. Until now, processing these payments had involved many banks, multiple payment technologies, complex processes, which vary among UN agencies and are costly and slow. Accessing financial services is a big challenge for many vulnerable communities that face difficulties opening a bank account, they lack identity documents, they live in remote areas with limited connectivity and services. There is a record 120 million people across the globe that do not have, many of them, the minimum uh, ability to be able to access this cash. With minimal overhead cost, in a secure, transparent, and accountable way, we launched the UN Financial Gateway. It's an initiative with Switzerland, the government. It standardizes and streamlines the payment infrastructure and processes the UN system used for financial transactions. The Gateway seeks to leverage digital financial technologies to help us prepare to deliver aid in a more agile and efficient way, while promoting financial inclusion. This is a collaboration across the UN, and with humanitarian partners, it could lead to efficiency gains of up to $60 million a year. Already in Ukraine, we've saved $12 million using the digital payment technology and reducing financial service fees. In Argentina, we saved 30% of our budget by mitigating local currency devaluation by using the digital wallet. This modality has assisted 2,500 households in Ukraine and Argentina alone. To scale up these solutions and reach those at risk being excluded, we have to invest in global connectivity, digital infrastructure, and digital and financial literacy. We need to bridge the gap between the financial ecosystem, available technical solutions, and the people that need them the most. We have to collaborate among many, many, many partners. So let's go back to Hannah. We all have a role to play in this global challenge. Hannah was able to rent an apartment where she now lives with her two children, her elderly mother, and her grandmother. We support people like Hannah who have been forced to flee to restart their lives and find a new home. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Kelly. I think this is so exciting. Let me just come with me just quickly. Sure. Uh, because people think about blockchain technology is just about exchanging money, but this is really where governments really help people in need. Like you told us the story about Hannah. But it is also about reducing the costs for governments and for countries to be able to help them directly. Uh, do you think that we're going to see a lot more advancements? Absolutely. This is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of both helping people like Hannah, but at a much reduced cost. You know, with, with the number of people around the world that are forced to flee, we don't have the resources to be able to assist them all. And governments who are on the front lines with partners to be able to respond to people that are coming to entirely new locations with almost nothing, we need to do it much more economically, much more efficiently, and we need to use technology to show us the way. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Kelly. Well, now I'd like to show you guys a very special story. Let's take a look. My name is Adit Philip Maze. I'm a South Sudanese by nationality, schooling at Our Ladies Girls Secondary School, and I'm also one member of the Arm the Court. For me, I Am the Court has helped me a lot because if I check back where I was, I was not that much confidence. I couldn't be who I am now. But because of I am the court, I can now speak to the people, speak to the world, speak out what I have inside me. And despite that, I am the court also has made me a leader, not only of myself, but also to the whole school now. As the school head girl, I am capable now of helping my fellow students. I am the court also is helping our school with the morning breakfast 
because we usually have one and it is far after four lessons. But sometimes it's, it is difficult to concentrate in class, but at least now we are able to be sustained due to the breakfast provided to us. And also, I am the code is helping us on coding because here in school just concentrate on books, but at least now we are exposed to the devices and we are also exposed to the technology. We are now able to do codings and at least now when we go outside there, it will help us. For me, what I can tell to the world leaders that they should include the refugee girls and they should expose them because where we come from, it is very difficult. We didn't have all the things that we have now because due to the culture and the society that we were living in. But now, as a refugee girl, I'm being supported. I'm exposed to the technology. I'm now able to code. And also, I'm able to change my people back there because they still have that mentality that we are being brought up of being neglected as a woman and as a girl. But if now we are included by most people and we are supported, the number of girls and women being neglected or discriminated, it will reduce. I would like to thank Lady Mariam because she is my role model. Because since we started, I couldn't make it up to where I am because I did not know my right. The only thing I do is just to listen to what society is telling me and do it. Thank you so much. Technology really making a difference. And Lady Miriam, please come to the stage. Uh, I'm so excited to hear your story. It's an honor to meet you. Please come forward. I know you have things to share, but you know, we're talking about this technology and how it's changing lives, and even in remote areas. So for this woman, and or young girl rather, and so many of the other young girls, you're able to get them onto the future by coding. So they're not just getting online, they're able to meet the moment of the economy. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I can't start my speech without thanking Doreen. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you so much. And also Kelly Clemens, who just spoke before me. And Ursula, the, the team behind ITU is just amazing. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So I only have a few minutes. I time myself, I promise you. Adit was supposed to be here, um, and she couldn't make it. And she was supposed to be here on the stage, but she's a refugee, and we tried very hard for her to be here with me today. So on, on behalf of the girls in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya, thank you for giving us a few minutes to just share their stories. Thank you. So I, my name is Lady Mariam Jam. I am the founder of I Am The Code. In 2030, six years from now, Adit will be here on this stage sharing her story with you. She'll be learning how to code, she'll be an AI specialist, she'll be uh, understanding what gen AI, gen AI is, she'll be understanding everything. Because she lives in a place where it's so hard for young women and girls. So hard. But thanks to UNHCR teams on the ground, Adit can now have an academy. The first ever academy open in the world in a refugee camp and asylum seeker setting. Where she's sitting right now, she's eating three meals a day. She's coding, she's developing the best coding languages in the world, from HTML to Python. When I started my work in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, I didn't know who Adit was. She told me, today I'm a refugee, tomorrow I'm gonna become a coder. And I think what is important that as we build the future, we must include young women and girls refugees. In Kakuma and Dadaab alone, we have over 900,000 people right now watching us. They're refugees, and they must be part of the conversation. I stand here today before you because I didn't go to school. I was born in Senegal. I was 50 years old yesterday. 50 years old. I know I look young. <laughs> but the reason why I share this story is because young women do grow up. They grew up and they do have the sages like this and stand up and share their stories at the United Nations. So as we build the solutions for the future, we must include young women. We must include refugees. Ref being a refugee is just written, uh, you know, it's just a, a title. But the girls don't feel refugees. They feel today they are coders. So as technologists, as we build the solution of tomorrow, we must do this. I'm very proud as an African woman from Senegal, 50 years ago, I didn't know I'll be standing here talking to you about refugees. 
But I have a duty as an African woman to make sure that I am making a contribution to my continent, but also we are making contribution to young women and girls across the world. So thank you, ITU, for including us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Miriam, thank you for investing in girls and in STEM, getting them involved. Thank you thank so you. much. Now let's travel 1,800 miles up north from Kakuma. Let's go to the cradle of civilization. Welcome on stage, for excellency, Amr Talat, Minister of Information and Communication Technology of Egypt, to talk to us more about skills and the hope of digital. Thank you, His Excellency. Thank you. The hope of digital, or is it the fear of digital? Distinguished guests, this is a question that resonates with millions around the world, and perhaps more so in the global south where I come from, where technological advancements are widening the economic gaps among our nations. And the ambiguity about AI's impact on jobs is leading many to wonder, will I find a job in the digital world? The echoes of skepticism about recent developments are looming large. But in Egypt, I also assure you that the sounds of hope are thunderous. While carrying out my public service duties, I travel all around Egypt to connect with people and gain, and gain first-hand insights into how the government can improve its digital services and empower our people with indispensable digital skills from the shores of the Mediterranean to the Nile Delta to the temples of Aswan, all across the nation, I consistently witness a common theme. A mother who left her career to raise her children is now thriving as a remote digital marketing manager of an American company right here from Alexandria, thanks to the skills she gained through our free scholarships. A fresh graduate, once struggling to find employment, Reskilled in our data analytics programs and launched a startup serving clients globally and creating jobs for more of his diligent peers. Another young engineer wanted to give back to her village. After attending our digital innovation workshops, she founded a successful e-commerce platform that not only supports local artisans, but also partners with development organizations to enhance their skills and invest in their local capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, the narratives of hope are imposing. They are invigorating and propel us to continue channeling public investments, to extend fiber optics in Egypt's rural communities, benefiting over 58 million citizens, around 50% of our population, to expand our digital scaling scholarships to more than half a million beneficiaries across the nation this year, multiplying the beneficiaries by 125 times over the past six years, and to continue digitalizing government services while ensuring their accessibility through multiple channels so that no one is left behind. The opportunities that our digital world is creating are glaring. Today, our world is open, open beyond measure, open beyond borders, open beyond nationalities, and open beyond our differences. Today in Egypt, we embrace our commonalities. We accept the challenges of governing technology to create meaningful, inclusive impact. And we are embracing the hope of digital. Thank you. Lisa Russell on stage, she's an Emmy Award winning filmmaker and she's going to talk about how AI is revolutionizing filmmaking. Lisa. Please. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so I just want to start off with a quick question. How many here believe that art can actually create a better world? Hands up, hands up. Fantastic. And I do as well. And that is why I spent the last 20 years pushing for arts and storytelling 
in the UN space. My name is Lisa Russell. I'm an Emmy Award winning filmmaker and the founder of Create 2030. And I'm a big advocate for artists to be working in the climate and sustainability sections because not only are we great entertainers, meaning we can help translate and amplify the great work being done in this space. We are also incredible creative thinkers and problem solvers, and we deserve a seat at the table to help find solutions to our world's greatest problems. Now behind me, you are seeing images that have been generated using AI through my Arts Envoy Lab, and I'm on a mission to help sustainability and climate advocates learn how to become AI artists, and that is because arts and storytelling is incredibly powerful, more powerful than we even realize. Did you know that there's research that shows that a brainwave of a storyteller actually syncs up with the people who are listening to the story? And people in a theater space, their heart rates synchronize with other people in the room. We have no idea the power of art and storytelling. But I do believe that if we trained every climate and sustainability advocate how to use AI to amplify and translate their work, we would have, we would have a much wider reach. So I'm sorry, Swifties. <laughs> Taylor Swift should not be the voice of the world. Instead, climate and sustainability advocates and creators can do so, and we should be using AI to help democratize access for BIPOC and Global South, Global Majority advocates and creators to help amplify these important messages. So, with that said, are you all ready to make some AI art with me? Yes? <laughs> Woo! I'm going to make you all AI artists today. So behind me, there's going to be a QR code. I believe it is coming soon. And this is a QR code for a survey about digital futures. I want you all to take out your phones, all of you, and I want you to do the survey. Because if you don't do the survey, you are not going to be part of this art experience. And I know you all want to be. So go ahead, take the survey. I'm going to disappear. I'm going to go do my art stuff, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to share with you the art that we have made together. How does that sound? Good? All right, thank you very much. I'll be back. Okay. I got my QR code. Okay, I got to fill out the survey. Are you guys going to fill out the survey? Please do, because she really has this extraordinary piece of art that she's going to put together, so I'm looking forward to it. So she's going to come back in session three to show us the product of all of our artwork. So please uh, get on the survey at some point. Now we welcome, now we welcome Lori Freeman, Global GM and Vice President of Salesforce of Nonprofits, along with Tunde Wackman, Chief Development Officer of World Central Kitchen. Lori Freeman. Thank you. We've already seen so many incredible solutions here today. There's no place on earth that can't be brought hope with WCK. Like I said, we've already seen so many incredible solutions that help people predict disasters and provide communities with critical early warning. But when that disaster strikes, World Central Kitchen is immediately on the ground on the front lines, mobilizing volunteers and local partners to start cooking fresh, nutritious meal. Because we know that a hot meal that is locally prepared is so much more than, a, than just nutrition. It is comfort, it's hope, and it's dignity. Since 2010, we have provided more than 400 million meals to support climate, humanitarian, and community crises. We do it all with a commitment to inclusivity in our team and in our work, serving everyone everywhere, bringing in the local community as part of the solution. And we do it fast. As our founder, Jose Andres, likes to say, when people are hungry, send in chefs. Not tomorrow, not next week, today. Mobilizing the right resources at the right time requires the right digital solution. So I'd like to introduce Lori Freeman from Salesforce. 
uh, to show you how technology helps us move with the urgency of now. Laurie. As you've said, time is absolutely of the essence. World Central Kitchen is able to impact the work ahead within 48 hours. So let's see how they make that happen. This work starts even before a disaster strikes. When those early alerts begin rolling in, they're able to reach out to volunteers in the area and quickly put out the call for support. Now the next step, preparing to feed those in need. World Central Kitchen partners with local suppliers and restaurants to serve meals that taste like home, but they're also ser serving to help stimulate the local economy. And that means working with different partners all over. So they simply must rely upon activation dashboards that help them understand what's happening in the area, tracking key information, like the number of meals served, the locations where they are, the recipients of those. Having that actionable data, it allows them to align with so many agencies like the UN, which helps inform the larger response. But of course, none of this would be possible without passionate humans who help support WCK through their financial gifts. So WCK manages their donor data and sends personalized journeys across each of these supporters. And they use these journeys to request critical funds to support their ongoing response efforts. As they engage their donors, they're able to adapt in creative and meaningful ways. They even send handwritten thank you notes. I've received one of those. All of this engagement and donation support, it has to be rolled into fundraising dashboards to track everything. This is what helps them provide continuity being data-driven. In a world where climate disasters are becoming more frequent and intense, we not only continue to innovate our disaster response through our partnership with Salesforce, uh, but we also continue to fuel our fundraising efforts through our Climate Disaster Relief Fund. This gives the WCK relief team on the ground the ability to solely focus on what is most important, using the power of food to lift up communities across the globe. To meet the challenge of this moment, we need all hands on deck, including the collaboration of many in this room. Together, we can provide meaningful support to those in need any time a disaster strikes. We hope you'll join us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, ladies. And now we're going to talk about digital inclusion in Saudi Arabia. Please welcome His Excellency Abdullah Aswala, Minister of Communications and Information Technology, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to share with us some of the advancements in digital inclusion in the kingdom. Your Excellency. The cost, the global cost of gender inequality is close to $7 trillion. That's almost 7% of the global economy and more than the joint combined output of six G20 nations. According to the UN, the world, us, we're not on track to achieve the goal by 2030. As a matter of fact, in some of these targets, it will take us 286 years. Over the next three minutes, I'm going to share with you a story of how a nation has achieved its economic prosperity and diversification under the leadership of Prince Mohammed bin Salman by focusing on gender equality in digital. This story, and I trust me when I say this, because I witnessed it firsthand, started when I was working for the Silicon Valley. That was the first time I met His Royal Highness. And he shared with us a vision, how he intends to empower people by focusing on women and youth, safeguard the planet and shape new frontiers while diversifying our economy. And fast forward to today, we have a lot to celebrate. I was told that MISC are here. Can I hear from MISC? So we started with MISC with Saudi codes touching a million women and youth with coding with a game called Minecraft. And it's no wonder that this story has only helped us achieve 
becoming the grandest and the boldest success story on planet Earth. But wait for this. It helped us achieve the highest success story in the most innovative platform known to humanity, sending the first Arab astronaut to the International Space Station, Rayana Bernawi. <laughs> Rayana, as a cancer researcher, she has devoted her life to fighting and predicting cancer. And as a matter of fact, in addition to Rihanna, the woman in the middle is actually my chief of staff, Nora Zaid, who has been the heartbeat and the executive force multiplier behind most of our successes in tech and digital space and STEM. And speaking of remarkable women, I have to talk about Dima Yahya, our general secretary for the Digital Cooperation Organization, how we have pledged under the leadership of His Royal Highness we're joining hands with 16 like-minded nations to make sure that we connect the unconnected, leave no one behind in three continents. And last but not least, I have to talk about Dr. Latif al Abdul Karim, who sits on the UN Secretary General AI Advisory Board, helping humanity achieve the outcomes of the summit of the future with a human-centric AI tackling the most pressing challenges in governance ethics and regulation. So it's no wonder that as we achieved the boldest and the highest success story in women empowerment in tech, space, and STEM under the leadership of His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, year in, year out, we have celebrated becoming a top five nation by the UN, by ITU, by UNDP, by the World Economic Forum. And the team was kind enough to remind me today that my time for my three minutes is over. But indeed, the time for all of us will be over when it comes to achieving the SDGs by 2030 if we do not start with empowering women in tech and digital. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, can I speak with you? Can I speak with you? Please. Oh, of course. I just wanted to take a few moments, of course, being a woman. Uh, I am charged by seeing so many women lead these initiatives. Why was it important for Saudi Arabia to do this and have women uh, just really be the cornerstone for all the movements going forward? It's 50% of our productivity, prosperity, and future. So it's only natural that as we move from 7% women empowered in tech, which was a position we did not want to be, to achieving 35%, surpassing the Silicon Valley average, the EU average, and even the G20 average, becoming the most successful story. And hear this, we have achieved our economic diversification by achieving 50% of our economy today becoming in an oil. Hmm. And, and tell me briefly, what has this done for other women in the country? seeing women lead these initiatives. It's gotta be inspiring. I bet you're gonna hear it from Noura, Dima, and the rest of the girls that we have here, how this has really not only transformed their lives, but have helped them contribute to a region on how we can tackle the most pressing issues. These women have led the study in collaboration with ITU on how we can connect the unconnected world, how we can deliver non-terrestrial networks to connect from satellite communication to devices, they have worked on a million, you know, empowering women and youth when it comes to the largest reskilling and upskilling activities with Saudi codes, starting up with Microsoft and Minecraft. And fast forward with AI, they are leading the work for the tech envoy today for the general secretary on how we can tackle the most pressing issues in regulation, in standardization, and delivering a human-centric AI for the world. Your Excellency, thank you very much. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. So, what is meaningful digital future for all? It is where everyone has the right to a safe, enriching, and productive online experience. And we heard earlier from Doreen's TED Talk, uh, if you'll recall, she mentioned GIGA, a UNICEF and ITU-led initiative can, to connect every school on the planet to the internet 
by 2030. That's only five years, I mean, it's not far away. And exactly five years ago, GIGA was born here at the heart of the United Nations. And today, we are celebrating GIGA's birthday, so let's take a look at this video. At GIGA, we are committed to connecting all the schools in the world to the internet by 2030. By mapping schools using satellite imagery and AI, and by identifying cost-effective methods for delivering connectivity through infrastructure analysis, we provide governments with the tools to advance digital learning. Let's take a look at Giga Maps. Red dots are schools that are offline. Green dots are schools connected to the Internet. In Dominica, Giga has helped turn red dots into green. Let's meet a teacher from one of those schools. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joan Moses, and I'm a teacher at the Roosevelt Douglas Primary School in Portsmouth, Dominica. I stand before you in New York for the first time, filled with excitement and anticipation. This moment is a testament of how connectivity can change lives. When my school was connected to the internet, everything changed. The internet has opened the door to a whole new world of digital resources, allowing me to bring innovative teaching methods into my classroom, creating a more stimulating and inclusive learning environment. My students are more engaged, more curious, and they're achieving more than we have ever imagined. This May in Dominica, 835 students participated in national exams online simultaneously thanks to the internet. Through GIGA, schools in our region have also collaborated with each other and shared best practices, allowing us to learn from each other teachers and address common challenges. The internet has enriched our discussions around critical topics such as climate change and social justice, encouraging our school community to reflect on our roles as global citizens. My students are learning about the importance of empathy, collaboration, and responsibility, qualities that are essential in today's interconnected world. Let us work together to ensure that every child, regardless of their location, has the opportunity to connect, learn, and thrive in the digital world. Together, we can bridge the gap and create a brighter future for all. But don't just take it from me. Let's hear from my students. Internet helps boost my learning, like when I have extra classes or extra activities and the teacher has like the flu or something, I still do do stuff. It means that it is a modern day school, it's a good school, and it also helps if your teacher needs to show you a slide show. Teachers can care for you, they can love you, and they can use the internet connection to help you learn. Giga is five years old now. Happy birthday, Giga! Help connect every school to the internet because with technology and great teachers, we can give our children access to information, opportunity, and choice. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today as a living proof that embracing the digital world unlocks a future filled with endless opportunities. When I first encountered a computer at the age of 20, I had no idea how profoundly it will change my life. Today, as a founder of the Tofara Online Trust, I have witnessed firsthand how digital tools can transform not one life, but thousands. Through our flagship initiatives, the Digital Skills Development Program, we have empowered more than 12,000 women, youth and SMEs across Zimbabwe and Africa. We are empowering them with digital skills they need for international trade. 
We launched an initiative called the Talent for Startups in partnerships with Digital Africa, where we are equipping the youth with skills needed to secure meaningful employment in the digital economy. This year, 58% of our students were young women who are now website developers, graphics designers, and digital marketing professionals, just to mention a few, giving them equal access to technology and digital skills. We stand at the crossroads of change, where the future of Africa is not just written by the hands of few, but by the collective efforts of many. It is a digital future for all, where women rise together as leaders, driving the digital era forward with their resilience, creativity, and innovation. Winning the Equals in Tech Award as a leader in SME in 2022 was a milestone for us that uplifted thousands of women who look up to us for inspiration. It shows us that our work and our voices matter. This recognition has fueled our determination to if work even harder, get opportunities to collaborate with women leaders across Africa. And also, as a board member of the Comesa Federation for Women in Business in Zimbabwe, I am advocating for a digital future where every woman is driving digital transformation for their businesses. My wish and my dream is to see every woman embrace technology, to see them learn, to see them innovate, and to see them lead. The future belongs to those who dare to step in the digital space and claim it as theirs. Let's build that future together. Thank you. Thank you, Tafara. And please welcome to the stage Pamela Coke Hamilton. She is the executive director of the International Trade Center. Pamela, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm supposed to have a teleprompter up here, but clearly not. <laughs> thank you so much, Tafara. Uh, you represent actually for us one of the great success stories of ITC and of the International Trade Center process generally. Um, you've done some powerful work and your insights are really incredible, especially what you've done in Zimbabwe. Your leadership and your mentorship, recognized by the Equals in Tech Awards, thank you, Doreen, has really empowered women to build digital skills and unlock economic opportunities. It's a reminder of what is possible if we truly commit ourselves to closing the gender digital divide and of what we can achieve if we dare to do things differently. It's why I'm so proud to be a supporter and a founding member of the Equals Initiative. Building a truly inclusive digital economy means creating access and actually enabling these same opportunities and tools that can ensure all women and all small businesses can have a digital future. Now, I want you to imagine with me a world where every small business, no matter its size or location, can access the same data, insights as global giants. A world where a family-run bakery in Cambodia or a craft store in Kenya can reach international markets, identify the best opportunities, and connect with customers they never imagined possible. A world where we have finally democratized access to digital opportunities, so no firm is left behind. Small businesses are the backbone of our global economy, but too often, they are unable to take full part in our digital age. Many don't know where to start, Many don't have the finance or the training to use the newest digital tools. Many don't understand what the buyers in new markets want. But what if we could change that? The good news is we can, and we already know how. In Southeast Asia, over 1,000 small and medium-sized enterprises have transformed their prospects through the Digital Export Enablement Program. They've been able to access online resources, like Google Market Finder, Trade Map, the Global Trade Help Desk, and Ecom Connect tools. They've learned what they needed to create their own strategies thanks to online and hybrid sessions and the support of a network of trainers. They're using AI-powered insights and tailoring digital campaigns to connect with new audiences on a far deeper level. And they're showing us how the future of business growth lies at the intersection of data, digital strategy, and innovation. 
After participating in the program, over 95% of the businesses reshaped their strategies and grew their global presence. This program was born out of a collaboration between the International Trade Center and Google, working alongside partners in the international space like the ICC and of course my good friend from the World Intellectual Property Organization, Darren. Very good to see you, Darren, thanks. And this was just the beginning. Now it's time to go global. When small businesses can access the same market insights, digital strategies, and online platforms as big corporations, the impact is clear. More growth, more jobs, and more inclusive economic development. The future belongs to those who can leverage the power of data. Together, I believe we can make that future possible. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Pamela, thank you so much. And the importance of digital skills is essential for leveraging digital platforms and AI tools. Please welcome Christopher Burns from USAID. Christopher, please. Thank you. Each year, more than 10 million students graduate from tech-related fields. These students are the future developers, engineers, and innovators who will shape the digital landscape not just in their home countries, but globally, because we know technology's impacts go far beyond national borders. By integrating a responsible approach into their education, we can ensure that they enter the workforce not just as technologists, but as architects of a digital future built on safety, inclusion, and justice. And the world needs such leaders. International development is replete with stories about the successes of digital technology, but not every instance has a happy ending. I heard a story a few years ago about a small business owner in East Africa who, in a moment of financial need, turned to a fintech lending app for a quick loan, as millions of people across the world do every year. The app's design, its ease of access, its seamless integration with mobile money made borrowing almost too easy. But what seemed like a lifeline ended up being a trap, much like a predatory payday lender in the US. Needing to repay this initial loan very quickly to avoid a high interest rate, this business owner turned to a second lending app, and then a third, and then a fourth. As this business owner said, the apps give your money gently, and then they come for your neck. So yes, the app did provide access to finance, but it did not solve financial inclusion, the true development challenge facing many countries. This story illustrates a theme we've heard many times, but seem to have not yet internalized. Technology can uplift humanity, but it can also deepen existing societal divides. Too often, the people designing these technologies are focused on innovation without considering the full impacts of their products and services. And as AI technologies are becoming embedded in our everyday lives, we cannot afford to miss this moment. This concern is what the Responsible Computing Challenge aims to address. Designed and implemented by Mozilla Foundation and sponsored by USAID, the challenge is an initiative that's reshaping how we train the world's future technologists, especially young women and girls, in an effort to close digital divides around the world. The challenge aims to embed responsibility into the core of technology and computer science curricula at universities in the US, in Kenya and India, and with more to come in South Africa, Ghana, and elsewhere. Students in the Global South are aware of these issues and are eager to address them in their communities. As a student in Kenya reflecting on their experience with the challenge shared, as my classmates and I step into the workplace, we will carry this knowledge empowered by a newfound sense of purpose, and we know the unique opportunity in our lives to ensure that when we enter the workplace, we are doing so with ethics, user-centered design, and responsibility as it means in a real world. The challenge we face is immense, so, in the opportunity, so is the opportunity. I invite you, policymakers, innovators, and leaders gathered here today to join us in this mission. The Responsible Computing Challenge is just the beginning. Your ideas, your expertise and your commitment can help us build a future where technology truly empowers every individual. Thank you. We'll okay. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we are now approaching the end of the session, but we're gonna conclude with a bang. We're gonna focus on our youth, which is so important because it's about laying out this future for them. A key pillar of this summit, future, and its action days. So please, let me call to the stage Sanjana Sanghi, Yuri Ramashko, and Daniela S.C. Darlington. Please. 
Have a seat. And for you. Okay. So, Sanjana, let me start with you. You feel strongly about girls getting access to digital technology. Why? And tell me about this. Thank you for your question, and good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Um, the reason why I feel so passionate about that is because I come from India, and I am youth champion for the UNDP in India, but I'm also a girl who's just grown up wanting access to education, wanting to build a life for herself, and I have been fortunate to be able to get that access, but in my journey of advocacy work, I have worked with girls in certain parts of our country that haven't, and I have my mother, who's actually seated in the audience here right now. Uh, shout out to my mom, who Where is a... Mom? Where is mom? <laughs> Where is mom? Mom, can you raise your hand? Oh, there she is. Okay. Right okay. <laughs> who is a 56-year-old Indian woman who wanted to make a difference, and the only way she could do that is because digital technologies allowed her to connect with girls from very, very economically backward sections of society in India. Zainab and Pallavi are her name, their names, and they belong to slums in India. Their parents do everyday jobs, if at all. They don't have any steady stream of income, but they have somehow got themselves a smartphone. So their course modules, they can see on their smartphone while my mom teaches them English, mm -hmm. which prepares them to be a part of the bigger world because they would never ever have gotten the opportunity to, to learn even just a basic language like English. So I have seen how women from two different generations and two different economic backgrounds with the tool of digital technology can come together and change each other's lives. My mom feels invigorated by teaching them and Zainab and Pallavi are off to hopefully a better future. Well, mom, you did an excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, Yuri. Uh, let, let's talk about you. You attended this, this thing yesterday, right, yeah. for youth. What was your biggest takeaway? Well, um, I want to deliver two key takeaways. First, youth extremely accurately identify the main challenges of digital future based on digital today. In according to youth consultations, which was held in a, a Spark Blue platform, youth determined uh, limited uh, literacy, uh, limited access to the internet, limited infrastructure as the key barriers which enable uh, access to the digital technologies. So all this requires our like, common and global efforts. And second thing, the voice of youth is vibrant and game changer today. Uh, it ensures that policymakers and institutions should engage youth into the policy making, into the reform agenda because of the IA technologies, because of the digital solutions provide a lot of new opportunities. They reshape youth opportunities and therefore it's extremely important to uh, engage and involve youth people into the decision making process right now. Well, you're a part of this decision-making process right now yourself yes. because we have leaders here from different countries, so your voice matters. Uh, Daniela, let me get you in here. Uh, what were your takeaways from yesterday's session? Right. Thank you so much for the question. So we realized that youth are more connected than ever before. However, there still exists a lot of digital divide in terms of internet connectivity and accessibility especially in rural areas. And with ITU, um, ahead of International um, Youth Day, we conducted a series of quizzes to gauge the level of awareness among youth in terms of internet usage and connectivity amongst others. And we realized that 66% of the youth were not really informed about where the biggest digital divide exists. So my key takeaway was that it's not enough that we bridge the digital divide, we also have to bridge the awareness divide because you can only empower someone to do something, they can only do something if they have the knowledge about it. So we have to create more digital literacy programs for our youth and we also have to create platforms where they apply those knowledge, especially where um, space technology is not so commonly known among the youth. We have to create opportunities where they can apply their knowledge in AI and space technologies to bridge and solve problems in their local 
communities. And my final words will be that we've connected our youth to the world, and it's important that we also connect them to its future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what, Sanjana, what does your vision for a digital future look like for all? Oh, it's a, it's a daunting, uh, you know, thought. But for me, there's always this kind of like an invisible prefix to the digital future, which is an equitable and, and just a realistic digital future. By that, I mean that anything untamed um, can just spill in different directions, right? So what I mean by that is that when I see, say, the youth being empowered with social media, when I see them getting untamed access, I see it having negative effects. Negative effects on their mental health, negative effects on their attention spans, on the way they use it. So I feel like everything else in the world, even access to digital technologies, needs to be guided and rooted. Um, like Daniela said, that the, the, the ones who have it have too much, and the ones who don't have none at all. So firstly, that equitable distribution is really important because, again, coming from India, I get to see it in a magnified way. And who's illiterate continues to remain digitally illiterate as well. So like many speakers here today have said that there are many development, uh, developmental kind of barriers that we have to overcome for any kind of equitable digital future to be possible. So I'm waiting for that digital future where it's more of a digital dividend and not a digital disaster. Okay. Sanjana, thank you. And for you, Yuri, what does the digital future look like well, for you? Uh, my vision of the digital future is based on the three pillars. It is inclusivity and uh, accessibility, um, digital literacy, and digital security. And my vision is very simple, to take action and transform challenges into opportunities in my community, city, country. I'm from Ukraine, where is the war? And because of the war, one of the biggest challenges is reconstruction. And uh, there are thousands of projects simultaneously happening from all over the country. And to properly manage, control, um, organize, we create DREAM. Digital restoration ecosystem for accountable management. It's an ecosystem as a single uh, pipeline solution where everyone see everything uh, what is connected with the reconstruction. Great, thank you. And for you, Daniela, what does this future look like? I'd also like to summarize that into three key words. Um, universal, affordable, and also inclusive. For anybody to be able to leverage digital solutions, it needs to be available for them to be able to harness it. Also, universality, universality is also key to affordability. So then we have to make sure that building AI technologies and tools, is, is, is we do that with cost in mind. Because I am a tech founder, and I realize how building AI tools would not be able to, people in rural areas would not be able able to leverage these tools if they don't even have access to it in the first place. So we have to factor all these costs into uh, digital solutions and innovations. And lastly, it has to be inclusive. We have to include people who are in the underrepresented parts of the world, those who are blind, um, people with disability. We have to bring them on board when we are developing technological tools so that it's not just for us who are capable, but also those who lack the ability to afford these things or able to leverage these tools are also, they also have the opportunity to partake in the digital future. So that would be my future, that the digital world is inclusive, is universal, and also is affordable. Good points there. Daniela, thank you. Sanjana and Yuri, this is our future. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> all so poised, poised and smart. Thank you all. Well, now Paul Foster is going to announce a pledge. He's the CEO of Global Esports Federation. Please welcome him. Good afternoon. Hello, Thank Paul. You very much. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be with you today for the, on behalf of our Global Esports Federation and our community 
of over 3.2 billion gamers around the world. Secretary General Doreen, Administrator Akim, thank you for the opportunity for our community to contribute to this important work. But gaming is more than a game. Our motto, World Connected, inspires us to do more. Just last month at the Paris 2024 Olympic Games, as a sign of our progress, the International Olympic Committee declared that they would create next year in 2025 the very first Olympic esports games. And so today, on behalf of our global impact partners around the world, we pledge a multi-year, multi-million dollar series of global initiatives leveraging this transformation potential about our digital world and the youth of the world. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. And next, I'd like to welcome to the stage Brad Smith, who is the Vice Chair and President of Microsoft UNSDG. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I know the time is running out. Let me be brief, but let me say just a few words. First, of course, to thank Doreen and Occam and ITU and UNDP for not just today, but all the work every day. I want to say just a few words about one critical topic. When we look to the future and we think about artificial intelligence, how will we ensure that it reaches and serves the global south? That, I think, is one of the most important questions before the United Nations this week and this year. First, I would say we need to learn the lessons of the past. Artificial intelligence is what economists call a general purpose technology. Think electricity. It changes every part of the economy. So first, let's learn the lessons from the history of electricity. 142 years ago, the first power plant lit up lower Manhattan and yet tonight, there are still 700 million people, 43% of the people who live in Africa, who do not have access to electricity. And what one sees over 15 decades is that every time electricity grew and people had access to it, economic development followed. But it has been extraordinarily uneven in many ways because of the economic structure of electricity. We all know that a power plant is very big and very expensive, as is an electric grid, even though an appliance may not cost much money at all. And the inability to overcome that economic challenge is, in my opinion, a fundamental contributor, even cause, of one of history's greatest technology tragedies because the electricity divide, I believe, is the fundamental cause in so many ways of the great north-south divide that shapes everything we are talking about here today. So now, let's go to the future and we have to ask ourselves, how do we ensure that this history does not repeat itself? First, we need to understand that the artificial intelligence economic structure looks a lot like electricity. At the infrastructure layer, data centers, they are big, they are expensive, they cost billions of dollars, even if it is very inexpensive to create an AI application. So what are we going to do? Well, first, we are gonna to have to do what was never done for electricity for the first 50 years after it was invented. Harness the power of capital and bring it to the world and not just parts of it. And that means private companies like Microsoft, where we spent more than $50 billion last year, not just in the US, but in the developing world as well. But it means raising more capital. It means turning to long-term development financing. It means making this one of the great goals for the next decade to ensure that AI reaches everywhere. Second, we not only have to be thinking globally, we have to be focusing locally, and that's what so many of you do. We need local language models so local voices can be heard. We need local data sets so that global and local problems can both be addressed. And in order to harness the power of AI at a local level, 
we need to recognize that just as important as the technology infrastructure is the skilling infrastructure. It is investing to educate more data scientists, data analysts, computer scientists, and the many, many, many other fields that need to be grown so that a local economy can put AI to work. If and only if we do these things, we can ensure that AI is a leapfrog technology that helps close the gaps that divide the world in so many ways today. It will require all of us. It will require new types of partnerships, but I think it requires, among other things, a spirit of optimism that learns from the past and does our best to repeating the things that have gone wrong before. Thank you very much. Brad, thank you so much. Just quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, you're giving us optimism. You talked about $50 billion Microsoft actually used around us, not here, but around the globe. Uh, and that we need to think locally, not just for language models, so you can hear those local voices. Because a lot of people are afraid of AI on a very granular level. Um, tell us just more about bridging that gap and, and how it can really transform the world. Well, I think bridging the gap probably requires a couple of things. One is it's another one of the great lessons of electricity. You got to go meet people where they are, show them how they can use it, and show them how it can make their lives better. It's an educational exercise that when you study electricity and how it moved around, it was key. And then the other thing that we also have to keep in mind and that I have to be, I think especially, it's important for somebody like me to, to say, this technology and the companies that create it need to be subject to the rule of law. Local laws in countries, all the way to global government governance, including at the United Nations. And that's why the kind of multi-stakeholder activism that you see on a day like today is fundamental to ensuring that this technology truly serves the world. And just really quickly, because I think this is an important point, talking about the skilled infrastructure, we also need to teach people about this new future and giving them the skills that they need. Yeah, and it's so fascinating because I think that fundamentally you start by thinking, well, you've got to teach somebody how to do data analytics or how to use a large language model, how to write prompts. All of those things are tr true. I actually think it, the first step is to show people what they can do once they master those skills. One of my favorite things, like studying electricity, was here in the United States where it didn't reach rural communities. There was a government initiative to just show people what it would mean to farmers, to women who were washing clothes or cooking food, you know, to men who were harvesting crops. You have to help people see what it means for their own lives and not in just some abstract sense. Wonderful. Brad Smith, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, in this next session, we are going to uh, see how we can harness digital technologies to protect the environment and planet. Now joining us is Nobu Akata, founder and CEO of AstroScale. Please welcome Nobu. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Take a look. This 10 millimeter metal ball could derail all the incredible digital progress we've been talking about today. This is a visualization of the space objects reflecting millions of space debris uh, ranging from smaller than this size to as large as a city bus size that are traveling around the Earth at tremendous speed, 100 times faster than a bullet train. This is an urgent threat to the satellites, which we rely on every day for digital technologies, from uh, climate monitoring and traffic control to uh, internet access and uh, disaster response. We used to think space was big, uh, treating rockets and the satellites as disposable objects. But today, space is very congested and unsustainable. And just one collision with this metal ball could trigger a chain reaction collision that could prevent us from using space for generations. 
At AstroScale, our vision is to make space sustainable, and our satellites are designed to create a circular economy to remove, reuse, relocate, defuel, and in future, uh, repair and recycle spacecraft, leaving no waste in space. This requires advanced technology to approach and capture fast-moving, uncontrolled objects in space. And our satellites are equipped with sensors to locate objects, software for autonomous maneuvers, and robotic arm to grab an object and remove or service it. This year, our AstroScale team achieved a historic milestone, successfully locating and approaching a real piece of debris. This is the world's first image of real space debris, an 11 meter long rocket body weighing three ton, taken from just 50 meters away. And here is a time lapse of a fly around. This debris is not sitting still. It's moving at over seven kilometers per second. When I saw this image, I thought this is beautiful, although it's just garbage. And then our next mission is to remove this debris, but uh, we should recycle this in future. Space sustainability is critical to safeguarding our future. And this matters every, each and every one of you. So be an advocate for space sustainability. Together, we, can, we have the responsibility and opportunity to ensure space as a resource that benefits humanity for the generation to come. Thank you. Your Highness, His Royal Highness. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Now we're actually going to turn to the Middle East. And earlier we heard from His Excellency Abdullah Al Swalha about his appointment of women for his vision of his uh, of the vision of the future. And joining us now is one of those appointments is Dima Ariaha, Secretary Gen General of Digital Cooperation Organization. Please come to the stage, Dima. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like at first to thank Doreen and Hakim for bringing us all together and giving us this platform to cooperate and partner together and bridge that uh, gap, the digital divide and the digital gap. Now, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, it is 2024, and yet there are still regions in the world where staggering 75% of the population remains disconnected from the internet. While connecting them is a priority, we must ask ourselves, if we were to bring everyone online today, would it really solve the pressing issues of poverty, unemployment, the lack of digital skills? Is that enough? The answer is no, because it is no longer just about digital divide. It is about gender digital divide, AI divide, skill divide, and the disparity in the quality of connectivity across the borders. So how do we address this? The answer lies in three eyes. Infrastructure, innovation, and inclusivity. First, infrastructure. Without robust infrastructure, true digital growth will remain a distant dream. Second is innovation. Quantum computing, AI, blockchain, and the Internet of Things, these innovations are not just breakthroughs. They are engines for transformation that we must nourish. Third, inclusivity. Bridging the digital divide requires more than just connectivity. It depends and realize that we clo close the quality gap and provide equal opportunities for all to fully participate in the digital economy. So how do we ensure a bright digital future? Ladies and gentlemen, 
introducing the Digital Cooperation Organization's answer, DEM, the Digital Economy Navigator. Well, there was supposed to be a video playing, but okay, I'll continue. So, navigating tomorrow, that is our goal. And with DEM, we provide the solution with constructive insights for digital growth. DEN is not just an innovative tool, it is a game changer. It offers comprehensive, detailed view of digital economy performance across 50 countries, and it goes beyond measurement. DEN provides a clear framework with 102 indicators across 10 pillars, measuring digital economy maturity in three main dimensions. Digital uh, enablers, digital business, and digital society. This helps countries benchmark their progress and identify the steps needed to go from consumer into producers, innovators, and disruptors. Through DEM, the Digital Cooperation Organization is taking charge in providing a solution that connects fragmented efforts, offers, uh, offers clarity, and accelerates digital growth. I call and urge all of you to seize this opportunity, engage with us, and use DEN as a tool for all international organizations, countries, private sector. We connect the dots and connect source and connect the supply with the demand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Dima, if you can just stay here for a moment. And sorry about the video. Unfortunately, we had technical uh, difficulties. No. But, you know, I, I spoke with His Excellency uh, Abdullah Aswala earlier, and he talked about the women who are being appointed these positions. And you are leading these efforts on a global scale right now, and you are giving the answers to the globe. Tell me about what this means to you personally. Well, this is a first, His Excellency surprised us today, and I appreciate that recognition. Uh, he and, and, of course, Prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman has been the, the force behind enabling women and giving them the opportunity really to, to lead. What is really beautiful and what, what is uh, uh, provided now for women in Saudi Arabia is not just the opportunity, but also treated, uh, and these positions uh, um, are looked at from a quality perspective and not just filling in a gap with uh, uh, gender uh, equality. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, we're blessed as women uh, to be recognized and given this opportunity. And now it's our time to deliver and, and show that we are up to the, uh, up to the task and, uh, and we can. So you're telling me that this means something to you personally. What do you hope the other Saudi woman living at home who happens to see this streaming, what do you hope it inspires in her? Well, not a Saudi woman, actually. All girls all over the world that uh, we can do it. And uh, uh, opportunities are there. We have to seek for these opportunities. And we have to uh, um, make sure that we're always learning and, and upskilling ourselves to make sure that we are up to always the task. Well, you are up to the task. And you, you are doing thank it. You. So thank you for inspiring all Thanks. of the women, not just Saudi women. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And I just want to remind the speakers, just for the sake of time, if we can condense the remarks, because I know people are starting to get hungry in the room, and we do want to break for lunch at some point. So please now allow me to welcome to the stage His Excellency Valentino Valentini, Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Enterprise and Made in Italy. Please welcome him. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the digital revolution is reshaping our world at an unprecedented pace. The rapid advancement of technology offers immense opportunities, but it also brings with it the responsibility to ensure that these innovations support environmental sustainability and equitable growth. To achieve a future where technology serves as a force for good, we must focus on integrating digital solutions with sustainable practices and fostering collaborations that bridge gaps and drive progress, ensuring that no one is left behind. Today, I'm thrilled to share with you an initiative that embodies this vision, the AI Hub for Sustainable Development, co-designed by Italy's G7 Presidency in partnership with the United Nations Development Program. This initiative exemplifies our commitment to leveraging AI for sustainable development and global progress, 
with a focus on the African continent. It reflects our conviction that the path to the future must be inclusive and equitable, benefiting every corner of our world. Our journey in creating this AI hub has been guided by collaboration, inclusivity, and a shared vision for the future of AI. We started by engaging with the African Union and securing the support of our G7 partners. We consulted with over 100 stakeholders, engaged with more than 300 AI startups across Africa, and initiated 80 partnerships focused on local language digitization. This collaborative effort ensures that the future of AI is shaped by diverse voices, perspectives, and innovative ideas. Our approach is centered around four critical pillars, data, computing power, talent, and enabling ecosystems. We are committed to deepening partnerships with our private sector and industry to strengthen the foundations and scale AI solutions that address the most pressing global challenges we heard today. Whether it's transforming energy, revolutionizing agriculture, improving healthcare, managing water resources, enhancing education and infrastructure, we've seen it all today well presented here. AI holds the potential to tackle these issues in ways we've only, we've only began to imagine. The AI hub is also a cornerstone of Italy's Mattei plan, reinforcing our dedication to sustainable development and innovation in Africa. This initiative wants to go beyond technology transfer. It's about co-creating, creating solutions together, learning from each other, and growing together. We believe that Africa must be a true partner in shaping the future of AI, and we're committed to ensuring that this journey is one of mutual growth and shared benefits. As we stand at this pivotal moment of the Global Digital Compact, I invite you to join us in this transformative endeavor. Together, we can harness the power of AI to build a future where technology enhances our lives, protects our planet, and ensures prosperity for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who's next? Thank you so much. And now I just wanted to take the moment to recognize the president, uh, the presence of the president of Malawi, His Excellency Lazarus Chakwari. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you a little bit later. And our next speaker is Jacob Granite. He's the Director General, Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. Please, let's welcome Jacob. Jacob, thank you. It's my great privilege to address you on behalf of Sweden on a topic of hope, digital sustainability and prosperity. The ongoing digital transformation presents mankind with plenty of hope for solutions to tackle poverty, build equitable societies, and find sustainable solutions in areas such as the green transition. At the same time, there are many risks related to digitalization, such as misinformation, and that vulnerable parts of society are left behind. To address these risks and opportunities, Sweden has worked with its co-facilitator, Zambia, the Secretary General's tech envoy, member states, and stakeholders in the inter intergovernmental process for a global digital compact. The compact has a key goal of an inclusive, open, sustainable, fair, safe, and secure digital future for all, and it's planned to be agreed here at this summit. Now, there's a strong link between the green transition and the digital transformation. Digital services often replace carbon-intensive services and transport and the circular economy relies on digital infrastructure and services. Let me provide one example of how the Swedish International Development Corporate Agency, CEDA, brings digital and green together. CEDA was part of establishing an investment, investing in the GSMA that we heard about earlier today, Innovation Fund for Climate Resilience and Adaptation. The fund has supported startups at the cross the section of green and digital, some of the examples in the agriculture space range from a system to share tractors in Nigeria to boosting fish farms in Kenya through Internet of Things solutions and to support farmers in Nepal to adapt to climate change through new techniques and success and access to information. 
These examples illustrate how the private sector can leverage the power of digital while ensuring the sustainability principles of the global digital compact. So in ending, the hope of digitalization in terms of contributing to prosperity and sustainability in support of a green transition is very large, and we hope the Global Digital Compact will provide a roadmap to unlock these opportunities for the benefit of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. And our next speaker, Ji Ping Chen. Thank you so much. She's the Vice President of ZTE Corporation, and she's going to share how connectivity and tire species can be saved and preserved in one of the most remote places on Earth. Ji Ping. Thank you. Thank you for uh, today's to have a chance to be here. It's my great honor. Um, I'm Summer Chen, and today I want to share a wonderful story. Do you ever thinking about a place is ever in, in touch in time and uh, is uh, rural, in charge by the nature? This is Kokushili. One is the highest UNESCO hesitate site. In these places, park rangers, they are wildly protect Tibetan antelope for poachers. And we find the digital solutions to connect these remote areas. This vast, isolated wilderness is a home to over 200 spices. When you step into Kagashili, it means leaving all behind the modern connectivities. Today, I want to share a remarkable story of hope. Through these digital solutions, we protect these remote areas caring for ecosystem in ways you never, never imagined. In these places, what the monthly without connection park rangers, what they are doing, not just protect antelope, they owning retirement entertainment, staring contest to see who would blink first. Despite all these challenges, in collaboration with our partners, ZTE embarked it in a, on a mission. We connected this unconnectable and achieved three breakthroughs. First, we successfully to build the first 5G base station. It allows for uh, observation and engaged animals and the live stream on the tablet, antelope migration and carry season. Nearly six, seven point millions of viewers tuned in world well. It greatly public wellness enhancement. Second, our 5G network will connect the park rangers for their loved ones through a reliable wearable course. We witnessed the rangers were overwhelmed by their first call. Third, thanks for these 5G technicals, we caught down the carbon emission. It's another big win for environmental protection. And all our commitment is not just for Kakashili. We pushing the boundaries worldwide. For ZT, our mission is quite clear to making the connectivity and the trust everywhere. We believe this digital inclusion is a fundamental pillar of SDGs. It's ensuring the digital future for all. Thank you. Ji Peng Chen, thank you. And now from the UN, let's bring up Fatu Hedera. Darren Tang and Taufik Jalasi. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Every solution begins with a problem. In this particular case, we are dealing with an invasive species 
called acacia bushes that invades the grassland of Namibia and takes up farmlands. The farmers affected were simply burning the bushes to recover land. A dangerous process, but also a source of harmful emissions. Unido's sustainable bush value chain project uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, satellite, and drone imagery to analyze and map the growth of the bush across Namibia. It is a prime example of how digital technology can be used to tackle environmental degradation and resource depletion. Artificial intelligence and geographic information system now identify where the acacia is growing and estimate the total biomass. This provides a foundation for the responsible harvesting of these invasive species and as next step, the harvested acacia is turned into marketable products like charcoal and cattle feed. Together with our partners, we transform a harmful environmental issue into an economic asset for local communities. A challenge becomes an opportunity. Funded by Finland, our solution has received strong support from national authorities and local communities, attracted venture capital, and led to the establishment of a factory for biomass processing. A factory like this means local value addition, job creation, and income generation. Our initiative shows how AI technologies can benefit rural populations and foster sustainable and inclusive growth. It is our collective responsibility to ensure that developing countries have access to such technologies to bridge the digital divide. At UNIDO, we will continue to explore the potential of AI for advancing local communities, job creation, and environmental sustainability. We look forward to partnering with all of you in identifying and implementing similar concrete digital solutions. I thank you. Hi, I think I'm next as the DG OIPO. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Darren Tang, the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization, the UN Agency for Innovation, Creativity, and Intellectual Property. Uh, innovation is a process by which an idea is turned into an invention and an invention creates impact. And one of the key work, key missions of WIPO is to develop a global network of technology and innovation support centers or TIS. But what are TIS and how did it really harness the power of digital to unlock innovation potential? Think of every innovation journey as a planting an idea in fertile soil. But like any seed, these seeds need the right nutrients to grow. And one key nutrient is information. One of the unique features of the IP system is that when you apply for any type of IP, you have to disclose information behind this new technology, new brand or new design. And with over 20 million intellectual property applications filed each year, this has become a huge database of information. Policymakers use it to understand technology trends. Researchers use it to identify new areas of research and decide on research priorities. And entrepreneurs apply it to find potential partners for their businesses. But making information available is only part of the story. Advice is also needed for these researchers, inventors, and entrepreneurs, especially from developing countries, to take their ideas from the lab to the market. By combining cutting-edge digital tools with expert guidance, WIPO's Technology Innovation Support Centers, or TIS, help to transform information into insights and insights into impact. WIPO's Pattern Scope is one example of information provided through TIS. Powered by artificial intelligence, it mines over 100 million pattern documents and close to 5 million scientific and technical materials to allow innovators to draw insights from all fields of human research. Another example is RD, or Access to Research and Development for Innovation Program. 
Through this single platform, inventors in developing countries can access hundreds of thousands of scientific and technical reference materials from over 100 publishers. TIS not only provides these digital tools, they guide innovators in how to make best use of them, turning knowledge into new discoveries that drive economies and societies forward. Let me quickly share the story of two amazing innovators, Luis Miguel Segovia and Maria Almanza, both from Colombia. As students, they developed a new solution for foot pain caused by high heels. Impressed, their professor encouraged them to turn their ideas into a business, which led Luis and Maria into a local TIS. Working with an IP expert, they confirmed that their idea was new, studied the market, and worked on a patent application. But support didn't just stop there. The TIS also helped them to apply for seed funding to launch a shoe line, Calzado and Mansa. Luis and Maria are two of the many innovators that have been supported through our 1,500 centres in 93 countries. TIS handled 2.2 million inquiries last year and close to 8 million inquiries in the past four years. We are proud of these numbers, but we're proud of still of people like Luis and Maria who are changing the world with their ideas. So let us work together to support them and others to bring their ideas to the world and build a better future for all of us. Thank you very much. Excellencies, esteemed delegates, distinguished guests, my name is Tofik Jalasi. I am Assistant Director General at UNESCO. I invite you to imagine a world without public services, without schools, without security forces to protect us, without care for the environment, without social security for all. These are not just conveniences, these are the backbone of our society. They uphold equality, inclusivity, human rights, democracy. And it is not a coincidence that SDG 16, which calls for strong institutions, emphasizes this. To fully realize digital transformation in the public sector could unlock over $3.5 trillion annually, according to a study by McKinsey. Yet, Despite significant investments, 70% of civil servants still lack digital capabilities, according to the World Economic Forum. The cost is not just financial. It's about lost opportunities to better serve citizens, eroding trust in institutions, and undermining democratic values. Obviously, we need to tackle this. What is UNESCO doing about this? Imagine equipping the world with better education, with digital skills, and obviously with full respect of human rights, dignity, equity, and inclusivity. We need to change not only the technology, we need to change the mindsets in order to change the behavior. And we do that through capacity infrastructure, in addition to what ITU has been doing, the meaningful digital infrastructure. One of the examples is our work on AI and the rule of law, training thousands of judges, prosecutors, on the new impact of AI and Gen AI on their work. And obviously, the, 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 the educational transformation, also the greening of education. So these, these are just some examples that we are working on in addition to with the African Union, with the ITU, with UNDP, our work on data governance and the capacity building for civil servants. So obviously we need to move from just policy makers and tech innovators. We have also to empower educators, citizens. Everybody has a role to play. So let's invest in a digital transformation that serves both people and the planet. Let's restore trust in our institutions and let's reinforce our democratic values. Thank you for your attention. I was supposed to sh play 30 seconds of the famous song, Imagine, but I was told I cannot do that because of intellectual property rights, especially in the presence of the Director General of WIPO. So you, you, can, imagine, you can imagine the music. Here are the lyrics. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you so much. If you can please exit the stage. Now up next for a special announcement, we have Alan Davidson from NTIA and Harrison Lung from E and.
Hi, I'm Alan Davidson, and I just want to say a very quick shout out and thank you to uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin for your leadership here, to the ITU and UNDP and all of our hosts for uh, this second Digital Action Day. Honestly, it has been it's been an inspiring day. And uh, as a starting point, as we've said, the internet is now the essential tool for communications in our modern world. It's essential for access to work, to education, access to healthcare, access to opportunity. And yet it is incredible that here we are in 2024 and that billions of people around the world still lack access to a high-speed internet connection or they lack the means and the skills to use it. That has to change. In the US, we're doing our part through the Biden-Harris administration's $90 billion Internet for All initiative to connect everyone, the president keeps saying everyone, everyone in America. And we are proud today to renew and expand our support for the Partner to Connect initiative, to mobilize resources to connect the unconnected around the world. In 2022, the Commerce Department delivered our Partner to Connect pledge in Kigali at the ITU's World Telecommunications Development Conference. And we pledged at that time to provide in-kind knowledge exchange and training opportunities focused on developing the next generation of leaders who will be improving broadband connections around the world. Since then, we've funded several efforts to grow global connectivity, but I wanted to highlight particularly the training sessions that have been so valuable that we've done in partnership with USTTI in Washington and in Rwanda. Both have focused on African policy leaders and entrepreneurs interested in connectivity, in internet governance, in space-based communications. I'll say I had the chance to meet with this cohort of extraordinary young leaders, and they should give us all hope for the future. They were truly inspiring. As the saying goes, the, the kids are all right. Um, this brings me to our news today. I'm pleased to share that NTIA is renewing and expanding our pledge. We will partner again with USTTI to bring a new cohort of current and emerging African leaders, all women, to Washington, D.C. for training. We will also bring them, yes, thank you, it's great. It's a great group. It's been a great group. And we're going to bring them to Silicon Valley as well for some experience with American-style entrepreneurship. Our grant uh, for the African Women Digital Leaders Training Program will promote best practices, demonstrate emerging technologies, grow the leadership skills of these participants and really invest again in this next generation of leaders that we need around the world if we're going to make this connectivity a reality. We plan to continue similar trainings focused on digital skills and connectivity in the years to come. We look forward to our continued partnership with the ITU on this important effort. I'll just say this is a historic moment. The pandemic reminded us that connectivity is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And the coming AI revolution is only going to deepen that divide for those who don't have internet access. So this is our chance to connect everyone in the world with the tools that they need to thrive in the modern digital economy. It's going to take a lot of work, but together I know we can achieve that promise of greater digital access and community around the globe. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and esteemed speakers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I would like to use this stage to reaffirm our commitment to building a sustainable and inclusive future, as well as add an additional pledge here on the stage. EN, formerly known as Etisalad, started as a UAE-based telecom operator close to 50 years ago. Since then, we have grown to become a global technology company with operations in over 30 countries across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, and over 175 million subscribers. Thus far, we've made significant public commitments as part of our sustainability strategy to fi across financial investments and population impacted in our operating footprint. Firstly, as part of the World Economic Forum's Edison Alliance and its One Billion Live Challenge, EN has pledged to contribute significantly to this mission by striving to improve the lives of 30 million individuals through enhanced network access, financial services, and technology education by 2025. In addition to connectivity, the digital services and applications, such as technology supporting financial services, healthcare, 
and education is critical to leveling the playing field. Secondly, as part of the UNDP, Digital for Sustainable Development Program, we will soon announce a strategic collaboration with focused initiatives across a number of areas, including AI, FinTech, and education. Stay tuned for that. Thirdly, as part of our commitment to ITU's Partner to Connect Digital Coalition, earlier this year at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, EN announced an investment of $6 billion between 2024 to 2026 in technological advancement, infrastructure, and innovative solutions to extend meaningful connectivity to everyone. This is particularly important as we aim to bridge the digital divide in our less developed markets, much of whom is operating in the global south. Today, on this stage, I'm happy to announce a new pledge to Partner to Connect, a new multi-million dollar commitment to the promotion of digital economies by bridging the digital divide and building skills in underserved communities. This pledge will address many of the issues we heard of in previous segments, such as resilience in disaster-affected areas through early warning systems, capacity building and reskilling to bring the next generation of workforce into the digital economy, and lastly, access to capital to women and small business entrepreneurs. We believe that the digital network and infrastructure is critical to uplifting the society in a digital age. Additionally, various digital services will provide access and capabilities to the general consumer and elevate enterprises to the global economy. EN is a proud partner with the ITU and the UNDP to contribute to a common vision of a sustainable, inclusive, and prosperous digital future of all. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Now, if Ruman Chowdhury can come to the stage, and His Excellency Busan Tujani and Robert Muga. Please, please, anywhere that's comfortable. I'll sit here on the edge. All right, His Excellency, let's begin with you. I believe you have an important announcement that's one to share about how Nigeria will encourage innovation in tech, but also while ensuring regulations around uh, data privacy. Right, um, if I start with that, I think what we're doing is a recognition that we have a unique opportunity now to rebuild trust between our people and the government by ensuring that we can leverage technology to serve and provide opportunity for them during live events. So when you give that to a child, you're registering a business, you want to pay your tax. We think the most important thing is that we're able to deliver this seamlessly and you know, most uh, comfortably to our people. So what, we, what, what we've committed to is ensuring that by 2027, that the lowest form of government is connected to quality internet. So we do have what we call the local government, which is the lowest form of interaction that our people get with our government. So the federal government is connecting all the 774 secretariat of our local government to ensure that the services that our people are seeking can be provided to them digitally. Thank you. And let me get you in here, Ruman. What do we need to do to ensure a sustainable and inclusive development for AI? Wonderful question. Um, with my nonprofit, Humane Intelligence, we focus on giving access to everybody in the world, not to build artificial intelligence, but to evaluate artificial intelligence. We know that AI models are not fit for use around the world in different cultures, different languages. The images that they create can be stereotypical or even degrading. So what we're trying to provide access to and what leads to a good, sustainable AI future is the ability for everyone to get their hands on AI and determine if it is good for them. Building that level of critical thinking and evaluation with AI systems is a key and often missing part of the AI development story. Thank you. Okay. Well, Robert, can you talk about, just in a condensed version, about the risk of AI in the global south? There are 
multiple risks, um, some of which have been discussed over the last uh, couple of hours. Um, some of these risks are already here. Uh, advanced cybersecurity challenges, uh, mass information pollution, uh, the overabundant consumption of energy used by AI, which will be up to 3 to 4% of all energy use within the next five years. Uh, some of them are on the horizon. AGI, artificial general intelligence, outside of human control, a real concern. And some we don't even know about. We set up a global task force last year with representatives from Africa, the Americas, uh, Asia, including an esteemed member on the panel, uh, to reflect a bit on what were the risks and what were the solutions for the Global South. Uh, we identified four big ones, and I'll only talk about two. The first is uh, job displacement and inequality. Second is AI bias and discrimination. The third is surveillance and privacy violations. And the fourth is the concentration of power in a small number of AI companies. With respect to job displacement and automation, probably the most important, uh, over 800 million jobs are at risk within the next five years from AI. In the Global South, according to the ILO, 56% of all jobs in the Global South are at high risk of displacement. That's significant. Hugely significant. So what are we gonna have to do? We have to do all of the stuff that's been just talked about in terms of multi-stakeholder engagement, but we also have to invest in job upgrading, we need digital literacy, we need job placement programs, we need to have employment uh, schemes, we also need universal basic income, really socioeconomic responses to what is a digital challenge. Um, and the good news is, a lot's happening. The AI, India, uh, AI for All in India, uh, Connectus in Brazil, um, digital ambassadors in Rwanda, NGOs around the world are also investing in this area. And I think we're also seeing UBI schemes from Namibia to India. So we see solutions, but we gotta scale those up. I so wish I had more time to talk with you. I've got like t 20 different questions in my mind about you already and, and what's so important in terms of these guardrails and what it means for society. Uh, you know, training, um, you know, workers about what is this new technology moving forward. So thank you all. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Really appreciate your words today. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And now it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce His Excellent Excellency, President of Malawi, Lazarus Chakwera. Please come to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm supposed to have my thing there, but bring me my iPad. Today, we stand at a pivotal moment in history, a moment where the digital landscape is not just a realm of technology, but a canvas upon which we can paint a brighter, more inclusive future for all. As we gather here, we must recognize that the digital revolution is not merely about advancements in technology, it is about the transformation of our societies, our economies, and ultimately our humanity. Malawi is therefore committed to bridging the digital divide because it is an economic and social issue. Our strategic plans for digital transformation include expanding digital infrastructure, enhancing digital literacy, and fostering an inclusive digital economy to ensure that no one is left behind in our digital journey. To accelerate digital adoption, Malawi has launched several initiatives with support from development partners. For instance, the Digital Malawi Project has been instrumental in expanding internet connectivity to public institutions, institutions whereas the last mile rural connectivity and inclusive digital transformation for Malawi 
IDT4M projects provide equitable access to digital technologies and foster digital literacy across all segments of society. Additionally, we have implemented a data exchange platform that leverages our national ID system as a single point of truth for identity verification. This platform is critical in ensuring seamless access to services, improving efficiency across government, and reducing bureaucratic bottlenecks. Complementing this, we have also implemented an e-service platform, which now serves as a single point of entry for all government digital services. These initiatives are premised on the acceptance that the digital age has brought forth unprecedented opportunities. It has connected us across continents, enabling us to share ideas, cultures, and innovations. It has empowered individuals, given them a voice and platform to advocate for change. However, while these initiative, uh, initiatives ensure that our citizens can access essential services with greater ease, transparency, and security, with great power comes great responsibility. As we lay the foundations of a digital future, we must ensure that this future is equitable, inclusive, and peaceful. Digital literacy is essential for full participation in the digital economy. Therefore, we are integrating digital literacy into our national education curricula and providing training opportunities for all age groups. Our technology hubs, which are training thousands of young people in coding, digital skills, and in entrepreneurship, are playing a crucial role in fostering innovation. These hubs are not only incubating new ideas, but also creating jobs and driving the uh, growth of Malawi's digital economy. A truly inclusive digital future cannot be achieved in isolation. Today, millions of people around the world remain disconnected, excluded from the benefits of the digital economy. Education and healthcare, this is not just unfortunate, it is wrong. And it is dangerous. As I said earlier, this divide is not merely a technological issue, it is a social justice issue. To build a peaceful future, we must ensure that everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status, geographical location, or background, has access to digital tools and the internet. This requires collaboration between governments and multilateral partners, private sectors, and civil society to invest in infrastructure, education, and digital literacy. And we strive, as we strive to bridge the digital divide, we call upon the global community to not only provide financial and technical support, but also to share knowledge, innovations, and best practices. The journey toward a digital future must be a shared one where no nation, no citizen, is left behind. In conclusion, laying the foundations of a digital future for all is a collective endeavor that requires our commitment, creativity, and compassion. As we embark on this journey, let us remember that technology is a tool, a tool that can either divide us or unite us. It is our collective responsibility to choose the path of inclusion, equity, and peace. Together, let us build a digital future that reflects our highest ideals, a future where everyone has the opportunity to thrive, where dialogue replaces discord, and where peace is not just a dream, but a reality for all. Malawi stands ready to embrace the future, a future where digital transformation is not just an abstract concept, but a reality that improves the lives of every Malawian. The future is ours to shape, a future that benefits all humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. The President of Malawi, Lazarus Chukwara. Please give him another round of applause. 
And thank you. And joining us once again on the stage is Akeem Steiner. He's going to talk about the promise of digital public infrastructure. And then there will be a video, and Akeem will give other remarks. Thank you, Akeem. And then thank you. Mr. President, um, as always, when you take the floor and you speak about your country and about the vision with which you want to take it into that digital age, we are soulmates. So thank you for being here today. Colleagues, I will speak briefly because we are behind schedule in a moment about digital public infrastructure, echoing some of what you have heard all morning in order to make a little bit more visual what we are talking about. Here is a quick video with some examples. Can we have the video, please? Prioritized in the Global Digital Compact and gaining momentum as one of the UN Secretary General's high impact initiatives, DPI is delivering impact at scale. It is turning possibilities into realities and empowering countries to transform our planet and people's lives all the way to the last mile. From Malawi to Finland to Brazil, DPI is a transformative people first movement. This movement recognizes the need for safeguards as an upfront necessity, not an afterthought. Embedding universal principles across every step of the DPI design and implementation journey ensures that the rights of people are respected and preserved and our planet is protected. This includes in Malawi, where 97% of Malawians have a legal digital ID being used to access services. This adoption saved the government 43 million US dollars in annual payments that were previously made to ghost beneficiaries. The same in Finland, where the X-Road data ecosystem offers over 800 public digital services and has scaled as a public good around the world. With a commitment to safeguards in the Brazilian digital government strategy, the Rural Environment Registry is helping to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement by reforesting 12 million hectares and creating interoperability between stakeholders and infrastructure across natural resources. But it is not just Malawi, Finland, and Brazil. The impact of DPI is growing, with more and more countries leveraging the transformative power of digital public infrastructure. To keep the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals, DPI represents a fundamental pivot that involves everyone, everywhere, and that includes you. Let's work together to build a safe and inclusive digital future for all. Isn't it amazing? This is all happening already. And congratulations just to three more pioneers. In many ways, development is, as we have heard from a number of people today, an agenda of hope. This hope for a better future has historically driven development and humanity's progress. If there was no hope, we wouldn't be where we are now. This hope still matters. And hope in one's own ability to change the course of history influence people's decisions and actions. This is why laying the foundations for a digital future is about hope and actions. I want to take you through the journey of building digital public infrastructure across countries today. In fact, it says with the video, but you have just seen it. So, you know, sometimes the script is a little bit behind. Can we go on to the next part? <clears throat> and as we stand at this juncture where our collective commitment to digital foundations can catalyze this brighter future for everyone, everywhere on our planet, I think you have already sensed that in the previous segment of this extraordinary day, we explored groundbreaking digital technologies and the profound impact they can have on sustainability and inclusivity. All the innovative solutions making connectivity universal and affordable, the digital tools enhancing inclusiveness, <coughs> the groundwork is laid both inspiring and formidable. Now, as we transition to discussing the fundamental structures that support these innovations, we need to collectively shape the future by laying the foundations that are safe and inclusive and serve the public interest. We often talk about physical infrastructure, things like roads and power lines and water utilities that are fundamental to development. In fact, for many, they are already taken for granted. These are the building blocks that elevate the welfare of people and allow people to gain a livelihood. Let's apply that same understanding for a moment to the digital world. Digital public infrastructure, or DPI, is an approach that goes beyond one-off solutions like apps or portals. It encompasses foundational systems like digital identity systems we just saw or payment platforms that allow people, businesses and governments to interact in a secure, inclusive and efficient way. 
This in turn enables everything from facilitating the access of vital health records online to enabling people more easily to start their own businesses. However, just as traditional infrastructure like roads and railway tracks have speed limits and guardrails, we also need to ensure that DPI has the principles, policies and institutions that keep the interests, safety and rights of people and protection of our planet at the very heart of these foundations. As we take equal access to physical infrastructure for granted, DPI must also ensure public value and provide safe, inclusive services at scale. While some governments are deploying DPI rapidly, others are just beginning their digital journeys. Both face risks like privacy concerns, data security, and exclusion without proper safeguards. Conversely, embedding safety and inclusion can reduce inequalities and foster trust. This is why putting people and our planet at the center of DPI is so critical. Digital public infrastructure plays a pivotal role in advancing all the interconnected sustainable development goals by employing digital technologies to address global challenges at scale. For example, foundational digital infrastructure, like digital identification platforms, have the potential to facilitate access to finance or access to healthcare. Again, we heard examples this morning already. Yet, fully unlock the potential of DPI, we must put people and planet at the center. This requires building on three essential pillars, commitment, capital, capacity. First, commitment. Governments must commit to the importance of inclusive, safe, and equitable digital systems, not just the hardware, not just the fiber optic cable or the devices. Trust and equity are the cornerstones of a progressive society. And without these safeguards, we risk creating systems that exclude vulnerable populations or violate fundamental rights. Brazil, India, and Estonia are often cited as prominent examples for their digital ID systems, which have advanced development. And these systems must be specifically designed with safeguards to prevent exclusion or data misuse. Second, capital. Financial investment is critical, not only for building digital public infrastructure, but more importantly, for ensuring that robust safeguards are in place. No single entity can do this alone. It requires a collective effort from governments, the private sector, and global partners, civil society, scientists, academia, everyone. Together, actors have to work together and leverage their financial resources to support sustainable, secure, and inclusive DPI that serves everyone. Third and finally, capacity. Skilled teams and empowered civil society and expert technical support and beyond are, beyond, are, are crucial for the effective implementation and governance of DPI safeguards. Yet capacity must go beyond mere technical expertise. It's about fostering an ecosystem. We've heard that word used quite frequently this morning of collaboration and accountability, where actors share knowledge and resources to ensure that safeguards are implemented and continuously adapted to protect the rights of all users in a rapidly changing field. Our commitment to DPI extends beyond getting the technology right. It must include ensuring these systems are secure, trusted, and protect the rights of all users. Safeguards should not be optional. They are essential to the acceptance and success of digital public infrastructure globally. People need to be empowered and free to shape their own lives. That's the fundamental basis for 21st century development, and together, we are not just updating systems, we are programming a future, a digital ecosystem that will enable every individual to thrive in this interconnected world that is already here. Thank you for giving me a couple of minutes to share these thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And now let's welcome Esther Dweck, Her Excellency, Minister for Management and Innovation and Public Services of Brazil. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. It's an honor to participate in this session. In Brazil, we believe the future must be green and inclusive, driven by a fair digital revolution. The digital agenda is essential to development, addressing systemic inequality, including the technological ones. Brazil is committed to a triple transition, ecological, digital, and social, reducing inequalities both within and between countries. Brazil digital policies are aligned with the SDGs, and we are increasingly considering the environmental impact of digitalization. Under President Lula's leadership, 
Digital public infrastructures are key to Brazil's digital transformation, ensuring sustainable, just, and inclusive development. We believe DPIs should be implemented with a proper and universal safeguards, built through participatory process to ensure that they are safe and inclusive and protect people's rights. A prime example is our national identity card linked to the gov.br platform, which provides access to over 4,000 public services for more than 160 million users. Other DPIs include PIX, our instant payment system that enhances financial inclusion, and the Unified Register for Social Policies, which improves social program management and access. The National Health Data Network ensures continuity of care through data sharing between public and private health care providers. The Rural Environmental Registry is a green DPI that supports environmental efforts such as reducing deforestation, restoring forests, implementing agriculture traceability, and fostering carbon markets. It plays a crucial role in a rural fin financial instrument such as credit and insurance, protecting biomes, increasing agriculture resilience, and will be a central at COP30 in Belém next year. Brazil is also advancing DPI for artificial intelligence, taking into account digital sovereignty. Achieving this requires a collaborative across government, especially those of the global south, civil society, the private sector, and multilateral organizations. Our national AI plan includes developing an autonomous capacity in the field and launching a Portuguese language LLM, which respects intellectual property rights and cultural heritage promoting AI in healthcare, education, and transportation. We emphasize open innovation, competition, and protection of human rights to prevent monopolies that stifle innovation. As we continue our presidency of G20 and prepare for COP30 and BRICS leadership, Brazil reaffirms its commitment to promote an inclusive DPI to foster a fair and equal digital future. Last year, we brought here a perspective on Brazil's DPIs, after a year, we are here returning to collaborate with other global voices seeking to promote digital inclusion, digital public infrastructure, digital public goods, and other strategies to foster an equitable planet. Together, we must act now for a sustainable, inclusive digital future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. Okay. Remember that art piece we said we were going to work on? You're supposed to do the survey? Well, now we've got it. We've got Lisa Russell back. Come on, Lisa. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So tell everyone what you did, how you did it, and take it away. So as you know, we collected uh, information from the surveys, and we generated AI art using only a keyboard. There are no cameras, no microphones, no graphic pens. And this is the beauty of AI art in enabling people across the world to have access to, to creating artwork for, the, for people and for the planet. And so I'm really excited to share with you the images that were generated using the data, data from the survey. Every answer, there are six answers, every answer corresponds with a different color of the SDG, and we synthesize the data fed it some prompts, some creative prompts, and here are some of the images that we have generated using the Digital Futures Survey. So if we can go ahead and show these images. And that is our official video. I believe there are three more images we're gonna show, I believe. So this was all generated using, see all the colors in it? Those colors correspond to your answers in the Digital Survey. And this is the kind of artwork that we can create. And again, this is why we need an arts movement in the UN. We need artists to be able to help translate and amplify the incredible and important work being done in these spaces. This is just a small example. And I'm hoping and I want to train every advocate for climate change, for sustainability, on how to translate their important work in art so that we can move audiences uh, it, it moved more general audiences. So I believe, are we showing the other images or? 
I think we are not showing the other images. Okay. So thank you so much. Well, I'll have to say, I think this is beautiful. Yes, thank <laughs> this you. is beautiful. But you know, it really is important. I, first of all, I love artists uh, because it's like you're the soul of who we are and interpreting what that soul is. So if people are interested in learning more, certainly from all of these agencies, they can contact you. Yes, Arts Envoy Lab is my program. I'm with Create 2030 and I am dying to teach young advocates on how to use creative AI. So definitely please get in touch with me. I appreciate it. Okay. Artsenvoylab.com. Thank you. Love it. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm going to contact you. <laughs> OK, well, that wraps it up for our morning session. Thank you so much. I'm Shadé Betterinois. And it was a pleasure being here with all of you today.